All right. So welcome again to another edition of the E29 Journeys podcast. And I'm very fortunate today to have in studio with us, Miss Christine Howard. Uh, Miss Howard is a longtime friend. Um, she and I go back to when her kids were working with me on the baseball side, but now uh, she has become a mentor and author and she is a motivational speaker and she was kind enough to make the drive up from San Diego for us today and uh, revisit the old uh, Riverside stomping grounds to spend some time with us. So Christine, thank you for coming. Oh, I'm so grateful to be here, Ernie. It's so good to see you after all these years in person and not just through social media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so when you were, um, when we were going back and forth and, and we've already had a little conversation earlier and, and I told you it was, uh, the time thing was always gonna be varied because we have so many things to talk about and, and with all of the guests, we just kind of let it go conversation wise. Um, and we were talking right now on how we wanted the, the conversation to go, but um, I think what really prompted me to to want to have you up here is that you've got so many different things that you're working on and i find that amazing because i think that you're kind of the model right now for what you see so many people that have the courage to kind of step out mm -hmm. and try new things and so i guess my biggest question to you was how how, how? did you decide to start <laughs> just venturing out on things yeah well Part of it was divine time, I think. And if, uh, you know, to go, I think, a little bit into my story mm -hmm. was, um, as you know, you knew me again as that mom. I was a wife. I was, um, I was a coach even back then when my kids were growing up. Mm -hmm. But I very much had put myself on the back burner. And I did have a couple key goals that I accomplished as I was raising my kids and supporting my then husband to, to climb the corporate ladder. Mm -hmm. But... Um, I had a couple of life wake up calls where I really was faced with the fact that I was not paying attention to what was important to me, to the things I was here to do. And through, uh, I don't know if that I, we had really much talked about this, I had an early breast cancer diagnosis. Fortunately, it was very treatable, very caught very early. It mm -hmm. was my wake up call. And I started to look at how I was living my life and not why did this happen to me, but how did I get here? Mm -hmm. And I saw that I, there were a lot of things that I was desiring to do and emotionally I was stuffing it. Things that weren't in balance in my life and emotionally I would stuff it. And ultimately that created dis-ease in my body and I swear that was a huge part of why I ended up with my cancer mm -hmm. wake up. So I started taking care of myself and saying what is it that I desire to do. So even starting with simple things of setting boundaries with the kids like you know they were teenagers then they don't need me every step of the way I can not that I was a helicopter mom but I was very involved in in their sure. well-being right even in their teens my daughter was in college so I started to see that I was my own person and I needed to reclaim what I wanted to do with my life. You know, mm -hmm. it, I felt like midlife was a new start for sure. the second half and and um, that times had changed, right? We don't have to retire and just sit in a rocking chair. Like that whole paradigm for me was, was gone. Mm -hmm. So I started to rejuvenate my coaching business and then, um, and, and, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, however you frame it, my marriage ended. Mm -hmm. And that was one event that took me to a really big deep dive. And I really started to look at everything in my life. And at first I went through all the normal anger, frustration, bargaining, like, you know, let's let's try and work this out and all, all peeling back all those layers. And, and when I finally got to the that bottom core, what I found is that I was not truly loving myself. Mm -hmm. And that sounds cliche in a way, but I could logically say it, but when I stopped to really look at, nobody did anything wrong to me. I was the one who was allowing certain situations that didn't make me happy, or I was the one who was was not using my voice and, and saying this is important to me. What Whatever it was, I started to see where I was not taking full responsibility for my life. Mm -hmm. And, and so then first and foremost, I, I needed to reclaim that love and care for myself. And, you know, someone who was a mom, a nurturer, a friend, a family member, right? We give all that love and that support out there right. year after year after year. And, and I know for me, that was a big reason why I became disconnected from who I truly am is because I was so focused on out there. 
And, and that's kind of what many of us are raised to believe and to do. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I remember when we were living here, there was a mom that that um, was doing her own thing. She she had somebody pick the kids up from school. She didn't sit and make sure their homework was done. The nanny did it. Or And I was like, that woman like right. she's not a mom like how awful is that and then and then i had to like you know kind of swallow my pride years down the road and said damn it good for her because she you know the kids probably grew up happier healthier because mom was creating some boundaries so anyway through that dive of um again peeling back those layers i i said this is my this is my second chance this is my chance to own my life fully to to do like the kids were grown and out of the house you know i had no significant other to say that i would actually ask for permission to do things Mm -hmm. and and so now if if i'm not happy it's there's nobody else i could even blame it on other than myself and i realized that anyway and so i just started to get really quiet and still and start to listen to you know what is it i desire to do As a little girl, I was a huge dreamer. I always had ideas in the neighborhood. I was rallying either my siblings or the neighborhood kids in the summer. And we had, we made plays, we had games, we did all this stuff. We were, you know, little things to make money. And I lost a lot of that because I started to buy into what culture told me was Mm -hmm. success, right? You go to college, you get the job, you get married, you have the kids, the dog, whatever. That I had the whole picture. So when I saw that that yes that brought me happiness to a degree there was a there still was even something deeper that I was here to do experience and be so that that whole cycle of the the trials and the tribulations and the wake up calls really allowed me to face in a way that I was never willing to face before right. what wasn't working in my life and and what I truly desired for this next phase. And so with that, one day I truly, I, I felt like I drew this line in the sand and I said, never again, and it's in my book, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but never again am I going to deny what my heart and my soul is asking of me. Mm-hmm. And And then from there, I just was willing to be a beginner and go out and be perfectly imperfect, make mistakes, look foolish, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and that was really a big turning point for me yeah. to start over. Well, it's interesting because you just hit on two things that I was thinking as you were talking. And we're, I think I'm a little older than you, but you had mentioned, and I talk about this with just the students that I have, and then even working with the school system, now it's really hard because it's more tangible for kids to realize that they can literally do anything that they want because there's so many different ways that people are are making a living for themselves or creating a life for themselves. And it can be whatever makes you happy. And in our generation, I've told people this numerous times in the last year, I felt as though you had five choices. Mm. And if you didn't fit into one of those, tough pick one right live it for 40 years get your gold watch get your retirement and adam and i talked about this how you get vacation when they let you have it you've (laughs) earned your two weeks look forward to it well we can't take your time this time but you can have it this time so everything is being dictated to you yes and like you had mentioned there's a stereotype of what a mom should be or what a dad's role should be and if you work and you can't make it to all of the school plays or you can't make it to all of the open houses you're a bad parent right but they're sacrificing for doing that you know most jobs won't let you leave at three o'clock to go watch your son play baseball or or to a swim meet and you have to kind of pick which lesser of two evil you want and like you said a lot of times it's giving of yourself because the perception is if I do more for myself then I'm a bad parent or I'm a bad wife or I'm a bad husband and that's just so it's sad I guess because Mm -hmm. there's so many people now when you get on the other side of that yeah, and you probably meet people all the time and you go, boy, they've got so much more to give, but they're just smothering themselves with this stereotype. Right. Well, and a lot, true, true, true. All of what you said is true. And a lot of that, I believe, is based on, and I mentioned it before, that cultural conditioning, right? You said mm-hmm. it. And and fear. Mm-hmm. I know, and, and that was a big part of the cultural conditioning, and it's a big part of what we are living in today, even. Sure. So, you know, I... But I was showing up just the way that I was raised. So part of what I came to terms with is 
my, you know, my my parents, God bless them, and you know, they they wanted the best for us, and so they they taught us beliefs. They you know they behaved in a certain way to give us what they felt was the best that they could give us. Mm-hmm. Not all of those programs were positive programs, right? right? Especially um, my dad was very instrumental for me in um, well, both parents were, but my dad from the entrepreneurial perspective, my mom from the the you know um, just selfless you know mothering role. And and so I can now, of course, look back and see how I just put all my needs, all my desires, just time and again, I, I would say, oh, it's no big deal. Oh, it's no big deal. Yours, right. is, your thing is more important, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and then starting to see that was conditioning. And now I can look at everything I think and do and say, is this getting me where I want to, you know, who I want to be and where I want to go in my life? And with that awareness, I I can kind of course correct and say, mm-hmm. oh, you know, you don't even have to get really super deep on some of the these programs, but again, to be able to see that this isn't necessarily who I came in as, it's my personality. Sure. And, and we can change that mm-hmm. through conscious awareness and and saying what what do I want to do instead. Right. So yeah. Um, but yeah, these kids, and I, I mean, I know, I, I will raise my hand. I had a very narrow view for my both my children. My daughter was highly academic. My son wasn't, <laughs> mm-hmm. but I didn't care, <laughs> really. Yeah. He was going to go to college. And after he, two weeks of you know of college, and he said, I, I just cannot sit here, mom. I can't. Sure. But now I see him thriving, and mm-hmm. he's active, and he's he has this memory. He just can see things and take things apart, put things, and he is like happier than he ever would have been if I would have tried to force him into something. Sure. So you got to let some of that go, right? Yeah. And it's tough, like you said, as a parent, because in your mind, you're doing what's best. Right. But it's very hard as a parent to let go and say, you know what, I've done my part in helping give you the direction. Now it's up to you to take that direction. And, right. I, and I know you're going to fail. I expect you to fail, but I want you to take those failures and learn from them. And that was the other thing that you had mentioned when you were talking to uh, before. Yeah. And I had said, there's so many people now that there's, because of these opportunities, our generation, it's a little intimidating. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because there's no guarantee. And, you know, when you would go into these so-called, those five avenues that I had mentioned, there was a guarantee. You know, you would, you'd find a job, you'd get a paycheck, they'd give you your vacation at the end of your time there, they would give you a retirement and, you know, you would live on that for the rest of your life. But now... I'm 55, I'm 60, and I've still got 30 more years to live. What do I do with that 30 years? Yeah. I don't want to just sit home. And there was even the time restrictions. It, it almost felt as though you had to do anything that you were going to do between nine and five. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, but what if all my friends are up at four in the morning? Or what if my friends are all night owls? And so now I think the clock has expanded. So people are doing business or, or doing things that motivate them 24 hours a day. I think we're using our, our time a little bit better now. Right. Um, and I think we're learning that there is there is no limits to what it is you want to do. You right. Know, I'm sure you've had meetings with people very, very early, very, very late because of East Coast, West right. Coast, different countries, things like that. There's Absolutely. just so many things for kids to, to do. And I think sometimes we're doing them a disservice by trying to force the old beliefs of absolutely. go to college and, you know. We absolutely are. Well, I, again, if we look at, you know, just how society culture has evolved, right? Mm-hmm. So back in the day, what did we have? We right. we had those, the world was more more narrow. And sure. now as from technology and, you know, science and, and all kinds of things, um, there's definitely more possibilities. And of course, the kids are going to be faster to pick those sure. things up than us because we yeah, are. We're coming in with that framework, mm-hmm. and 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 a lot of that is the unknown, right? Mm-hmm. So you talked about the uncertainty, and we. So there's two pieces to that. One piece is, I don't. You tell me if this was for you, but I know it was for me. I was raised as use your brain, think about this. You know, it was think. It was all about your logical brain. My, no one ever told me, follow your heart. You know, it was very much be smart, you know, and, and then do this strategic thing. So mm-hmm. over time, we, we, I know for me, I was raised to not listen to my intuition, was raised to not follow some of those deeper callings. And, and I think some of these kids, you know, are, are just coming in 
from the get go saying, I, I'm not going to be pigeonholed into this, you know, um, mind game, basically. Sure. So, so again, there's this this little rub that's going on, mm-hmm. and it it definitely takes time to for the older generations to adjust to this. But mm-hmm. and even the the time frame too. So. Um, the uncertainty. So one of my favorite hashtags I use in social media is it's never too late. Mm-hmm. So regardless of what age we're at, there's there's always that opportunity to go back inside. Get, don't people spend so much time and struggle so much when they're trying to think, what should I do next? Mm-hmm. And they, they spin and spin and spin. The wisdom isn't going to come from those preconditioned beliefs. It's, it's going to come from tapping into a place they're probably unfamiliar with and that's going inside and listening to their heart if i call again you can get even more metaphysical and say your soul but i guarantee any person who's in a transition or who's one career is ending something else is starting or they're just feeling lost Mm -hmm. um all those opportunities are available to them too if they're willing to kind of step back and and be open to something they never had even thought of before sure well, let me ask you this, because you, when you touched on this a minute ago, and I was going to ask you, in your mentorship and in you kind of walking alongside of people, I think sometimes people view their mistakes mm. that they've made as something that they don't want to share, mm. rather than taking that and saying, you know what, here's an opportunity for me to help you avoid these right, mistakes. Right. My mistakes are what got me to this position and kind of enlightened me, depending on what my view is and i'm going to help you by sharing my mistakes with you but it's very hard to be open that way because you know you had mentioned your wake-up call came from a lot of the things that you look back and said i didn't do this the way i wanted to yeah they weren't all successes but you actually gained more insight through those things that maybe you didn't try or things that you put aside and now that's opened you up to having a lot more information and a lot more to give people that might be walking in that same path absolutely that was a huge shift for me because I always viewed mistakes as shameful, right? right? That you, you never want to make a mistake. Again, that's mm-hmm. one of the things that I was preached to about in school or what, whatever the case, you know, um, you have to do the right thing, right thing, right thing. Mm-hmm. That was drilled into my head. So absolutely, uh, you know, as a coach, a speaker, one of the big things we learn early on is to our story has impact for other people. So I may not necessarily, I do weave it in when it's applicable, parts, different parts of my stories, because it is funny, clients go through things absolutely that you have gone through. Um, I, but I always, always love to share what mm-hmm. some of those core things were that I learned. And and I, yeah, I totally don't see it in that shameful way that I did before, but it's, so now my perspective is anything that doesn't work out is is a gift for me and there's something I'm meant to learn from it. Sure. If I keep repeating it, all that means is I'm stuck in a mindset that's not giving me what I really truly desire. Mm-hmm. And so I need to, again, that's information I need to shift. So um, any, all of us have that opportunity to, to share a, nu- a nugget of wisdom without telling somebody what to do. Mm-hmm. In fact, it's more powerful to say, hey, I get you. Yeah. I, I was in your shoes a year ago or five years ago. And, um, you know, here's what I did and here, mm-hmm. or here's what helped me or here's how, what moved me forward. I think, again, that's a big shift that we're seeing is where our parents and teachers told us what to do, right? We were, the finger was pointed at us and, and we were made to feel bad if we had a, an opinion any other way. Sure. Like all those walls are breaking down and, and, and it's so funny for me because I was raised so just you know, yes and no, good and bad, black and white, that now, uh, like I, whatever you were to, would tell me, there would be no judgment. It's like, that's your beautiful divine journey. And who am I to say sure. your belief or your thought or your action is is something that should be judged? Yeah. So um, did I answer your question? No, no, you, you did. <laughs> but that's that leads to the next question where we talked about all of the things that you're trying. Yes. And we say trying because I'm sure even you would say, and I would say the same thing. I mean, I I get intimidated when I get around professional people doing this because I don't really have a basis for my questions. I'm just, I'm listening and talking. And if something sounds interesting, then I'm going to ask you about it to to find out more. And, you know, in a self-serving way, every person that I've had in in here to talk, even though I have a background history with them, I've always walked out with something else 
creative in my mind from the talk or listening to a way that they went about it and taking the similarities of their journey and saying, okay, well, I went straight when they got here and they took a left. I wonder if I go <laughs> back and I take that left. So you start kind of thinking about different things or different ways of going about it, like just our short conversation and going back and forth and looking at the things that you were doing and some of the ideas that you throw me. I thought, well, maybe that would work better than what I was doing. Or I just like trying things now more than I did before. I, I was very rigid with, now this works, let's just stick with it. But now I don't, I don't worry as much about if it doesn't work, it doesn't right. work. Right. Well, know? you start to become more childlike. Yeah. Not immature, but that, and this was, again, a huge, huge shift for me because I was very much like like you, you know, and because even after um, I spent 17 years in corporate America mm -hmm. as in, um, in, in information technology, so it was very right brain and left brain. There was definitely the logical side and there was creati creativity, but it was a very structured environment. So again, you're, you're taught, you make the decision and you go forward and you, you have this path. So now, so whether it was starting to write my book or starting um, uh, a product that I created, I, I, I've never done this before. And so I, I had nothing to draw on and I had to go back to being that childlike mm -hmm. um, essence, which was curiosity and wonder. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what I could do. I wonder how I might be able to move this project forward or, or get someone to help me or whatever that sure. is. So I, day in and day out, use curiosity and wonder mm -hmm. as, as a tool and it makes it so much more fun, enjoyable, easy, mm -hmm. you know, and then, then the next step comes to you without you having to labor over it so yeah. hard. Well, and it's interesting you say that because I was wondering as you were saying that, I wonder if you had maybe done some of these things before, there might be some fences and restrictions that you naturally put in, like some of the things that we've done in the past that just yeah. instinctively, because we were raised a certain way, no, this isn't gonna work. I'm not even going to try it, but I know this isn't yeah. going to work because someone else tried it and it didn't work. Rather than say, you know what, I might want to try it a different way. I think right. I can make it work. Let's see. Yeah. You know, I really try and not look at somebody else sure. because there's so many things I don't know. You know, we can see, you know, if we take social media for an example and we see somebody's done some whatever achievement, accomplishment, mm -hmm. we're, we're only seeing what they're posting we don't sure. know and maybe if you know somebody personally like i i definitely have reached out to people personally and talked about things like with the podcast or with the book i i will i've utilized resources that way but here's the distinction where there's a certain time when i do that because I, i'm so really desiring to tap into what's authentically coming to me as an idea as a project that i want to let that kind of take take root gotcha. and start to bud before I squash it. Because that was my old way where I wouldn't, I would shut something down. I wouldn't even give it any attention. And time again and time again, you're just squishing, squishing, squishing. Over time, you're just like, there's like these little neural pathways that get connected in your brain. So you're, I think I severed my creativity mm -hmm. from squishing that down for so many years. And I will say, I I am a dreamer and a creative and, and I have many more ideas than, than I've ever brought to to life, mm -hmm. and there's probably some that I've tried to bring to life that maybe I, you know, that did go nowhere. But that's okay, sure. you know, that's okay. But you know, as I listen to you say that, I'm thinking kind of off the path here. But yeah. there's a lot of songs that yeah. have been made hits <laughs> that weren't sung by the original writers. Yeah. So maybe as a mentor, some of your ideas they may not be for you, right? But you might know someone that can take that idea because their skill set might be able to decipher that idea. And, and run with it. And so Absolutely. that actually would, would work more into your mentor side. Right. You know, but you, they used to call them idea people. Yeah. You know, I just have all these different ideas. I don't know how to make them work, but I have right. people that do. Well, it's interesting. I'm working with a coach now and she, um, she was, I was talking about my show that I'm launching next month and show, show slash podcast. Mm -hmm. And, and she was questioning me, you know, kind of challenging me on my on my topic and my format. And she said, and, and I won't go into why, but she said, here's a show, I've, I've had this idea for like eight years now, and I've brought it up to several of my clients and, and nobody's really, it hasn't really resonated with anybody, but it resonated with me and I'm mm -hmm. like, you know, I'm gonna sit and think about that because again, the show I was coming up with was based on what I know, what my thoughts and beliefs, even from a creative perspective, you know, she was 
like one level above me in her creativity. And mm-hmm. so it can almost elevate you if you're open to it. Sure. Like you said, you would never change. It's like, no, I'm just going to stay this rigid path. But there can be that one little thing you hear. You're like, ooh, I can tweak it a little bit. Now it's 10 times sure. better, more impactful or what, whatever the case. Mm-hmm. So again, it's it's part of that is being open. Yeah. And no, that's, things I will mean, come to you. No, that's <laughs> great. I mean, that that's it's it's exciting to me because I can tell you that you know, people would tell me before when I was doing the coaching, oh, no, I love baseball and I love doing the instruction. And I think the reason I got out of the day-to-day coaching was because that seemed mundane to me. Mm. There, there wasn't a lot of variables in it. And I think that when I started doing the uh, the one-on-one things and, and working, it became more of a, not necessarily social, but it was more of a personal interaction. And I had to reset every 30 minutes or every hour because the way that I would work with Chris was different than the way that I would work with Adam and different than the way that I work with Brian because everyone's personality is different. And what I think always kept me interested in that was that everyone learns different. And so some kids were, I could pick up right away. They were very verbal. They would interact. They would ask questions. Then there was those that didn't say a word to me. (laughs) And I had to just do all the talking and provide all the energy. And so I think that kind of helped me to push myself into finding different ways to relate to people. That's awesome. Which, had I worked a regular job, I probably wouldn't have had to. Right. And so I think that kind of gravitated me towards something like this. I enjoy talking to people, I think, more than I probably let on sometimes. You know, some people would (laughs) would look at it and I go, well, it's just more, if it interests me, I'll ask you. Right. If it doesn't, I won't. It doesn't doesn't mean anything personal. It's just, you know, I kind of know what this job does or I kind of know what you do for a living and I don't really need to know a lot more about it. Right. So it just kind of created an idea. And as I talk to people that come in, it creates more and we'll see where it goes. I love it. Well, I, I want to touch base on something you said because I think it's super important. You, When you were in the regular coaching and you saw that, yeah, it's it's okay, but it's not really fulfilling me, mm-hmm. right? You were, Whether you were bored or you just had your fill of it. And you were courageous and open to to do something different. Mm-hmm. And and I, I love those kinds of stories and examples because we do continue to re- get information. And, and so many times people discount it, don't listen to it. Like, again, that was me back in the day. I would get information. I would just say, uh, I, don't, I don't think so, right? Sure. So the more we set that example for ourselves and then the people whose lives c- we touch Mm -hmm. see this example they hear our stories they see how your energy how jazzed you are still about what you do they're gonna they're gonna ask you they're Mm -hmm. like how did you get to be where you're at and you can tell the story right and that the more all of us do that live authentically to who we are what really is working not working to us it's going to have that positive ripple effect on every person that we interact with even i've i've changed someone's life by one sentence one day and <laughs> and and she told me for like a year afterward when we would um go take walks she said that I, that that one question you asked me and seriously she was suffering about something and all yeah. i asked her i go it sounds like you're you're suffering about this and when she said out when she heard that question asked out loud and she answered it the next day she she ended the suffering and she did what she wanted to do that was ho- she was holding herself back from sure. doing and it changed it changed her yeah. so it's the little things that sometimes too we don't realize. Well, and I'm going to make a statement, and I'm sure you would back this up because of what you do now. I sincerely hope that every person that listens to this or that we come in contact at some point follows that little voice. Yes. I, I, I would really feel bad for people that don't ever have that spark for something. Everyone should have something that makes them feel like I could probably do more than I'm doing now. Yeah. And no matter how big of a step it is, you know, whatever job you're doing, I, I sincerely f- want everyone to take that step and look internally at some point and say, you know what, I was meant to do more than this. Right. Not to make any job or any uh, career insignificant, but I think just as people, we Absolutely. should be motivated to try to do something more. Absolutely. 100% agree. And again, there's no expiration date on that. So right. anytime, regardless of what mistakes you feel you've made in life, every day, you know, there's, I don't even know what that cliche saying is, but it's every day is a fresh start. Mm-hmm. And we just have to decide today is, you know, today is the day that we're going to cross over that line and, and take a stand for our life in a way that we haven't before. So mm-hmm. that can be, again, 
it could be kids. You know, my son had his share of troubles and you know, I, I knew teen years could be tough. His were a lot tougher than I ever imagined. Mm-hmm. And but I, I never lost faith in him and who I knew he was at his core. And that whatever happens to us isn't who we are. Mm-hmm. Right? There's again, we can ignore things. We can ignore our knees. We can ignore voices. We can be really hard on ourselves and and put ourselves into some pretty bad places. Then we make a lot of mistakes, but that doesn't have to define who we are. And the longer we we focus on the the mistakes and Mm -hmm. and we rehash and we relive and all of that, we're just reinforcing a, a, a moment in our life. Mm-hmm. So to be able to, you know, let that go and start to listen to that voice of, you know, think back when we were little kids. Like, I know I love to create. I was that dancer. I was that, you know, um, um, made up plays, just always like I wanted to babysit. Like I was, I wanted to do things to, to get money and to do things I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And so, it was fun for me to go back and connect. So we all can, you know, even if we didn't have the best childhoods, I think we can remember kind of who we were at that pure essence and know that that's still inside us. Mm -hmm. And regardless of anything, we can rekindle that relationship. It's interesting when you you talk about going back and being a kid, I tell my daughter this all the time. We're, my daughter became a Beatle fan because of me, and I probably stole this from, you know, I think I was maybe nine or ten, and you always get that question in elementary school, what do you want to be when you grow up? And and I say it because it's a poster from John Lennon, and he says, you know, teacher had asked me, what do I want to be when I grow up? And he said, happy. And I think I regurgitated that, but I remember that thinking it didn't resonate with me at the time, but now looking back, what else would there to be? Right. You know, and how you get that is up to you. Mm-hmm. But the the end result is that you're happy doing whatever it is you do. Where, like we had talked about, I think past mm-hmm. generations were taught to put a career at the end of that statement. Right. I want to be a doctor. I want to be right. a fireman, whatever it is. But when you kind of take that statement and you kind of go back when you were a kid, and because I think we were all asked that at some point, how did you answer it? And how does that? translate to where you are now. Yeah. Well, you hit on a key word and that's happy. So Mm -hmm. I I would love to dive into that a little bit because part of what we've seen culturally is I'll be happy when, Mm -hmm. right? I'll be happy when I have the job that that has a certain amount of salary or when I have the degree or when I have the house or when I have the spouse or whatever that the thing is, right? So, and it never ends. So you you achieve that and or receive that or get, get that and then it's, the next mountain, the next mountain. So part of what the shift that I've made, and again, in working with my clients is, again, is that we can truly be happy now, Mm -hmm. regardless of anything else, because happiness is, is, and here's a shift too, happiness, we can create happiness based on just pausing to be grateful Mm -hmm. for, for having another day of life, for there's always something to be grateful for, no matter what the circumstances are. So I started in my journey to really focus every day. And I would, at one part of my life, I was writing like 25 things a day that I was grateful for, and I couldn't repeat. So, and I really had to start digging deep on and it wasn't the obvious stuff. Oh, I have a pretty smile. I have a house. You know, it was like, mm-hmm. like who am I? Like, you know, I never give up on my dreams or I'm, I'm compassionate or whatever those things were. I had to get really still and silent to, to come up. But the more I focused on that, the happier I became, mm-hmm. regardless of if I was going through my divorce mediation or, you know, I was you know, in my post-surgery and dealing with, you know, things like that. And, and so I've continued that. And, and again, it's something I, I, it's like one of the first things I always talk to about clients when we get rolling is, you know, how often are you in gratitude about your life? So one of my more recent mentors, he's very much, we were kind of taught the cause and effect, right? So this happens, which makes me feel unhappy. This happens, which makes me feel happy. And it's truly the other way around. We mm-hmm. can create, we can be happy, and then the positive thing shows up in our life. It's that self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm-hmm. So the person that says, oh, just I never get any breaks, or oh, why do I always date these same loser guys? Or, <laughs> you know, oh, woe is me, oh, woe is me. 
all they're doing is giving energy to a negative thing. Sure. And and they're never going to be happy if that's how they're continuing to show up. Mm-hmm. So so again, kind of having that childlike thing, like just be happy in the moment, be grateful for whatever it is you can be grateful for. You're feeding yourself and, and energetically, you're attracting more of that positive stuff to you. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah, and I don't think people are aware. And sometimes, I mean, everyone has those friends or those acquaintances that they're just those draining type of relationships. And then you realize that they bring you down. Oh, for sure. <laughs> because you get mired into, you're just constantly trying to put a Band-Aid on all of the things that they have rather than them looking outward and saying, well, I can do this tomorrow or I can do this with my life or, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. And re- regardless of whether you follow through, that's the beginning of it. The Absolutely. ideas, the thoughts, the positivity, the the ideas to get out of the hole that you're in. And I think that's the hardest part. And when you're going into mentoring and I know I'm going to, I'm going to kind of transition it into your, we saw the sign when we walked into the mission, the radiant. Yes. So (laughs) that's, uh, that's where we're going to go with that. So this is kind of where you've started. Um, we're going to talk about the book, but we're going to talk about radiant life. Yeah. What, what does that mean? And and what do you do to perpetuate that? It was perfect because the thought I had in my head, I wanted to make sure I linked in is Mm -hmm. one of the first things changes I made to have this radiant life to and what I call it is like living life turned on Mm -hmm. where you wake up every day and you are again grateful you're happy you're optimistic you are you are the co-creator of your life right Mm -hmm. one of the first things is that you have to take 100% responsibility for your life now I I might ruffle some feathers in Mm -hmm. this conversation here I played the victim and and I didn't see it clearly for quite a while how I was playing the victim. Anytime we complain, anytime the oh, woe is me, we're playing victim to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. And and I'm not saying you shouldn't, I'm not, I don't want to judge anybody because certainly I was there. It's it's part of our journey. And, but the more we say, I'm not going to blame you, I'm not going to blame the government, I'm not going to blame my church, I'm not going to blame my parents. I'm going to open my eyes and and listen and pay attention to what I say, what I think, and what I do. Those are the things I can control. And so that's that's a foundational piece is that you have to be willing to take 100% responsibility for mm-hmm. your life. And And then part of that is, again, getting quiet and saying, what's important to me whether you look at it from like what do i value or what's what kind of vision do i want to have for my life i have my clients if they haven't done it already take every core area of their life from finances relationships um their home environment fun spirituality community and and write out your vision Mm -hmm. draw a picture of if you're living your ideal life what does that look like so many times we're in so many people are in reactionary mode. Like you're just like playing ping pong, right? You're you're not the one carving and crafting the ship. You're just trying to, you know, dodge dodge <laughs> right. stuff coming at you. So again, take that step back. We have to create that vision for our life. Mm-hmm. And no one vision is better than the other. This is where we have to get out of comparison and don't look at, well, let's see, my neighbor's got that. So I think maybe I'll do that plus this, then that'll be better. It's it's truly getting getting that quiet and that heart center. And, and again, a lot of times it's going back to what did I always wish for my life when I was younger? Yeah. So having that vision. And then the next thing is finding a great support system. It could be a spouse, it could be friends, it could be a community, it could be a coach. But I I have seen firsthand for myself, I I was always a do-it-yourselfer, like I'm strong, I'm independent. And for so many years, I suffered in silence because I was trying to do it all by myself. Mm -hmm. And, And not that I didn't have confidants and girlfriends and coaches ultimately, but once I got into a community of people that were all committed to truly like, being courageous and and living bringing that vision to life and not and and being willing to let go of old things that community was pivotal for me Mm -hmm. so being connected and then uh, working from the inside out so instead of just looking externally like how do i get 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 
start with who do I want to be, right? And then tap into, okay, if I want to be kind and compassionate, wh- how do I think? Mm-hmm. How, you know, what are my actions? So you start to get really quiet with yourself and question. Um, and then, and then again, it could be really like a starting over or refinement of, of who you are and looking at part of that journey of living that radiant life is looking at your stories. So where where do I continually beat my head against the wall? Where do I continually failing or, or struggling or feeling pain or being triggered? You, you pause, like reflection is a huge part of my life. And again, something I teach for a radiant life is take time every day to reflect, whether you write it in a journal or whether you um, just sit over with a cup of tea or a beer or whatever and just mm-hmm. think about how you know how did my day go or if i got triggered stop in the moment instead of just pushing through it um step back and say okay what's that all about because and then ask yourself three times because it's never the first thing it's mm-hmm. like peel back peel back peel back so um taking time to reflect is part of it um i love letting inspiration come to me letting those inspired actions come to me so we talked about talked about this a little bit before we don't have to think so hard to to achieve those things we want to achieve in our life if we come in it from a place of openness knowing that we're not we're not alone we whether you believe in god or a higher source or power of some sort I believe there's an energy around us that, again, it's that vibration. So if you're coming from a place of openness and wonder and and happiness and joy, you're gonna attract happiness and joy into your life. So I've had so many funny things and and my my clients and these women in my mastermind, we we got to start, we started our sessions sharing our synchronicities. Mm -hmm. And so something, uh, somebody would say, oh, I was writing um, to find this nonprofit something about a nonprofit and then the next day they get a phone call and it's it's the answer or they see a billboard or they overhear a podcast and and so our lives can start to flow instead of us really trying to push like again this is how we were taught culturally like you just drive 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 and you make your life happen mm-hmm. i i, I want to say i think for some people that's changing i i have just surrendered all of that that's kind of how that definitely was how I was to a degree, like I was gonna make it happen and I was gonna push until I got it done. And I've surrendered. I like, I will, if my book takes three years, it takes three years, but I'm not gonna stress. I'm not gonna lose sleep. And and not that it hasn't, I haven't gone through uncomfortable things, mm-hmm. but I, I, I've learned again, if my, if my I vision for my life is to be happy and have joy, well, Pushing is not making me happy and have joy. Mm-hmm. So know that the steps are gonna get done, my self-care is important, my health is important, my relationships are important. So you start to take a bigger perspective of whatever you're working on and in your life in general. So it becomes more holistic mm-hmm. than just this narrow focus, which again, career, career, career is it was that career success was the path we had. So look at how many people have money. This the these CEOs, these business owners, their relationships are wrecked. They they don't have a relationship with their kids. They're they're isolated, they're they're unhappy and they're miserable, you know? And and not everybody's that way, but that's part of what can happen if you're not connected with the, that inner stuff. So it's got to, you know, I, I say it, it It starts from that inner inside, listening to what your intuition is saying, your heart is asking of you, honoring that, taking those inspired actions, um, reflecting on it. And then, t- you know, what kinds of s- sacred rituals? That's another part of it mm-hmm. is uh, my one of my rituals in the morning is my cup of coffee. That first cup of coffee, I just sit there and it's amazing. It's like a drug for me. I don't know. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> but um, I love that first cup of coffee meditation. Um, you know, s- some women like that candlelit bubble bath or, you know, that weekend away. You can just have that time to sh- decompress, like whatever you can do to honor what you need that it doesn't have to be that go, go, go. Like we can get off the treadmill. We're only on the treadmill because we are we are choosing. Even mm-hmm. if we don't think we're conscious of it, we're still choosing to do it. So yeah. that's 
the painted picture of what it <laughs> what it looks like and in, in components mm -hmm. of it. Well, there, uh, there was so much in there that that I was kind of thinking, and and one of my first questions was going back to what you had mentioned about getting the time to self reflect, the quiet yeah. time. I think that's another thing that society has kind of put on us that if you're not active, if you're not going nonstop, and people use that as an excuse, oh, I don't have time for me. I exactly. don't have time to, when do I do that in the morning? You know, I've, I've got to get up at four, I've got to get up at five, at six, I've got to do this. And I think we create those roadblocks for ourselves. Totally. And that was one of the other questions I was going to ask you. When you have a client that comes to you, what are some of the things that you try to get them to open up to when they don't? really have that desire or understanding how important it is to take full responsibility because i think it, you had even said it as as human yeah. beings it's our nature to say yeah. it, it wasn't me yeah if this had happened for me like it did for him right. i would be living that life right. or you know there's just so many things that as people we we don't want to reflect negatively on ourselves even if it can be good for us right well I, you know I, I ask a lot of questions and so I, I never try and t tell anybody what to do. Mm -hmm. So I can, you know, I, one of my favorite questions is, how is that working for you? <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and I've, had, I've had a client say, I'm not ready to deal with that. That's perfect, you know, because it's their divine time. Mm -hmm. it's, not my, it's not my time. And so, uh, you know, I will, I will push them beyond their, uh, not push them, I will, talk beyond their edge i will question them you know where we're dealing with that edge and a lot of times just asking a question me asking a question um i have um i've had some really successful highly successful clients but but they've still kind of pigeonholed themselves mm -hmm. in, in without giving away any life details sure. so asking these questions and then again speaking something out loud i, I can't tell you how many times i've had a client say I never realized that. I never realized that that was having the impact. So a lot of what I do is help people come to the awareness of the mindsets that they're walking around with. Mm -hmm. So everything that's happening in, in your life is a result of what you're thinking. Sure. And your thoughts are your beliefs. So when we start to say things out loud, and this is why, I, I don't know, I need to see it, I need to hear it, I, I need that multiple touch point, mm -hmm. um, I'll reflect back to them what they said or, or ask the question and then they start to see to see it mm -hmm. so it's it's really it's where they want to go right mm -hmm. so i'm coming in with a blank slate uh, and if there's something i can offer that again help me then for sure i'll, I'll offer that up yeah because i think that's from just talking to different people in different walks of life and different successes that's kind of always the starting point and you wonder with so much information out there now, you know, all these different avenues to get life coaches or to get help with your business success right. or to whatever it is Ugh. you're doing, you almost feel like, how do you miss no. that point? And, yeah. it, and you think it's not really get, being missed, it's just being ignored. Right. And then the next thing is when you have clients that are in that go, 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 and like you said, they're very successful in their lane. Yeah. But at some point, we all know that lane's going to expire and I'm going to have to do something else, whether it be retirement, whether it be a pandemic where you lose your job, things right. like that. And we kind of touched on that earlier that this last year kind of created a lot of forced resets for people, mm -hmm. jobs, family situation, child care situation, educational situation. Right. And, and I think if you are really open to what you're talking about, you can – Here's your chance. I can recreate totally. myself to be anything I want to be. Totally. Because nothing is the same anymore. Totally. And so we're all kind of in that same boat. And I'm I'm more curious and, and positive about the people that are going to grasp that. Yeah. You know, yeah. who's going to take that opportunity and say, this was put on me. Right. I had nothing to do with it. Right. How right. am I going to turn that into a positive? Absolutely. Well, and it goes back to a couple things. The first one is that 
we so are fixed on we want to know and this again was me <laughs> i wanted to know how everything was going to turn out and it was like the biggest joke of my life yeah it when i had to drop all the bags one day and i just like i had to let go of everything i was trying to create again it's great to have a vision but when we try sure. and force things to happen so so i now have become really comfortable and i actually love uncertainty mm -hmm. because it, that's where all creation can come from and it, it does kind of force us to get out of our heads and, and dig into that, those creative energies and juices and, and, and potential that is just lying dormant that we haven't tapped into. So, you know, how many times did we hear the word pivot, pivot, pivot? Mm -hmm. You know, so some restaurants were able to pivot. I remember reading early on, they started like, they ordered thousands of takeout boxes and they're like, okay, here's the takeout menu and and they were able to they actually did better yeah. right so so many people the first reaction is oh my gosh my life is over right right and and again that's conditioning 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 that we've all so many of us have grown up with so uh, a lot of people struggled maybe a little more than they had they had to because they weren't willing to you know, get themselves regrounded to say, how can this be an opportunity for me? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, again, no judgment. Everybody kind of comes to things in their own time, but for sure, um, I, I know I had this stirring maybe uh, two weeks into things. Like I couldn't sit still. I'm like I had all these speaking engagements lined up and they all got canceled and, and no one was going to reschedule anything for mm -hmm. the near future. What am I like? I just felt like this energy, like I, I'm, I've got to do something. What can I do? What can I do? And I, so I started doing these Facebook lives every day for 51 days, mm -hmm. and I called it moving forward while staying put. Mm -hmm. And so I offered a nugget every day, and um, it was so energizing for me to be doing something right. So people have that, like, what can I do? And what do they do? They they drink, they overeat, they <laughs> they sit and complain about it versus putting that energy, you know, redirecting that energy into sure. something, anything. And, and it could just, you start with one thing and then let it lead you. It might not be the thing that you end up, you might try three different things. But, you know, I've had, um, one one of a gal I know who's a uh, an artist like she started doing these virtual concerts through through Instagram right so we we can find different ways if we again are open to know that there's more than one way yeah. and and when one door closes an another door opens that can lead to things we never would have imagined so I'm like like. That is how I live my life right yeah. now. Yeah, you hate to use the word thrilled because of all of the tragedy that went I along agree, with it. I agree, I agree. You know, there's always a part of me that, that looks back and, and I, I can't sit here and tell you that I take complete responsibility for everything I do, but there's always a part of me now that has learned that everything that literally happens for a reason and you hear that cliche all the time. Mm -hmm. So you can't necessarily fight every little battle. So something put me here or put us here as a right. people for a reason. So let's all figure out the reason. And even on a small scale with, with what I do, you know, I had conversations with all the kids. Yes, it, it's horrible for you. Yes, you're a senior. Yes, you're not going to. But realistically, if you were graduating in the 1920s, you didn't have a graduation party. Right. If you move forward out of high school to college, 50% of your classes are going to be online anyway. So you were given a crash course <laughs> in how your next four years is going to be. So now you're going to be that much more ahead when you get to college. The kids that continued to train with us during the past year, I, I had kids lose weight when they needed mm. to. I had kids gain weight, get faster. And the way that we explained it to them was at the end of all this, it's going to come back. College baseball, professional baseball, it's not going away. Right. It's going to be a different version, smaller maybe, because some kids aren't going to continue. Some colleges had to close up for financial reasons, but it's going to come back. And there's going to be two kinds of people at the end, the ones that complain because they had a year <laughs> taken away from them, right. or the ones that just continued to do what they were doing and work, and they're better for it on the end. Right. You can choose. Right. You got two choices, and either one is yours. Right, exactly. And, and most of them took the option to work through it, and now, hey, it wasn't really that long, That's was great. it? It was right. a year, and it went like that. And now mm -hmm. here we are again, and you're not behind. You're actually ahead of where you were. Right. So just getting them to understand that, and you know, the difficult part, me mostly dealing with, with younger people, 
we didn't have answers as adults mm. and we're the people that they go to right but then us as adults we look up to the cdc we look up to the government and they didn't have the answers so i think that was what was probably the most unsettling for a lot of people like yeah we talked about our generation where we right. want to know what's going to happen want to know and then <laughs> well you know and then i i will say i i after like a week and i didn't i i don't honestly really watch the news that much and some people might be shocked or that whatever <laughs> but energetically right so we and i think this is again if i look culturally mm -hmm. the the amount of stress and, and i've been doing some reading on on some some energy like just some evolutionary stuff but the amount of stress in the world that we have and it's it's felt collectively by every one of us mm -hmm. and and i i like i consciously choose to not watch the news i would go onto my phone when mm -hmm. i felt like okay i needed i want to get an update and i want to read it i don't want to hear it i don't want all the dramatic music and <laughs> and conversation right. and you know banter between people and oh my gosh but but as a society i i, I want to say you know people are addicted to it addicted mm -hmm. to it and so they're they're so focused on that like sitting on the edge of their chair what's that next thing what's that next thing versus how can you use the energy right so yeah. again if if you know a takeaway is we we can we ultimately control how we show up in our lives and yes there's certain things we want to be respectful and follow guidelines and get, i get that but we don't have to stay in the energy of a 24 7. right and and, and see because he, part of that too people don't realize stress is is impacts your body mm -hmm. so a lot of the disease and i know you know some um oh, i forgot who said it multiple people have said it but 90 it's like 90 plus percent of all disease mm -hmm. is preventable right and and i have some friends that are are like energy workers and healers and they literally part of my one friend's job is she does myofascial release and there's the energy of traumas that have happened whether it was a surgery a car accident uh physical abuse are stored in our fascia the energy gets stuck in our fascia and so people with like 30 year old incidents that where they couldn't walk or they had like a limp or they had certain like things with their hands like it, they are free of that now mm -hmm. so when we don't and the same thing happens in our organs right so um, again I, I say i believe that's a huge part of of um what was going on for me i had so much like heartache and heart pain that i was just stuffing in in that chest area so where's it's 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 there and um it, again this is like not western stuff necessarily but if you start researching some of what um the you know science is truly proving this stuff we can we can at any moment with our thoughts and our beliefs start to get out of that because stress is you're in fight or flight fight fight or flight mm -hmm. fight or flight we were never designed to be that so the the system for healing and repair never gets to kick in because we're constantly people aren't sleeping even in their sleep they're not bodies not sure. able to repair so you know all the pill popping nation we have oh, like i love everybody <laughs> i truly love everybody but like just pause to see what you might be able to do different and how mm -hmm. you are feeding into the result that's happening in your life. And and again, I, I, I will raise my hand, like, you know, totally, it's not an easy thing to do, but with support and, and guidance and you can turn things around. I've seen dozens of cases of it from the circles that I run in. Yeah, and it's difficult though, because going back to how we started, it, it all starts with you. Yeah. And that's a lot of responsibility for a lot yeah. of people. It's easy to pass that off on to everyone else. And, yeah. and again, you know, I've I've kind of expressed this to people before where, you know, maybe the statement comes out selfish, but, you know, I'm willing to take all of the blame because I'm egocentric enough that I want all the applause. Oh, <laughs> so I love that. I, I don't, Perfect. you know, I, I don't, I'm fine <laughs> taking all of the blame for yeah. all the stupid things I did, but yeah. guess what? I'm the only one that wants his back patterned when I do yeah. things right. right. So, you know, in a way that's just my weird way of 
motivating myself to do those things where I don't necessarily listen to what other people tell me that's right or wrong or whatever. And I think that's part of the way that I try to de-stress myself because I yeah. don't, I, you know, you get to a certain point in your life where you realize that there's a lot of things that you can't change, but there's things right. that you can work on your own and, and do them and right. just try to keep yourself in a positive mood and Mm -hmm. We're going to get happy. We're going to get sad. We're going to get yeah. angry with people. It's just part of it. It's you know, part of it. you just have to find different ways to deal with it. And I think, um, you know, in your position, when you become enlightened and, and you're willing to open yourself up and share that, um, you know, one of the reasons that I feel like I've been so successful with the kids that I work with is because I'm. I'm more open to tell them how I ended up doing this because kids will ask me that, you know, how did you end up being a coach? I wasn't very good as a player. Yeah. Well, so that's, <laughs> that's simple. You know, right, the, the, you can right. only, your talent's only going to take you so far and then you've got to do something else. Right. So this is how I, you know, I was actually better at showing you how to do things that I couldn't do. So, right. you know, my, my failures became something that I was able to, to create something different with. And so, you know, I know a lot of guys that were in my same generation that were still angry and they still, boy, yeah. if I had, you know, I never got Ugh. the chance or so-and-so didn't like me, the coach didn't like me, the, you know, and, and you hear that all the time. Absolutely. And so even on my end, it's, it's hard to try to get the kids to understand. I, I know you hear all this stuff, but it's not. Yeah. It's, it's up to you. Good. And regardless of whether you play or not, we're not, we're working on baseball, but we're working on skills for after. Awesome. Because your best career, you'll probably be finished at 35 or 36. Mm -hmm. And then you've got 45 more years, 50 years of life living. So the fact that you're dedicating yourself on a weekly basis or a daily basis to something that's going to be your life's work, that's going to help you in your job. That's going to help you in your marriage. That same stubbornness that helps you overcome what we're working on or that same dedication to get up every day and go to the gym is going to translate into a job or translate into how you treat your kids or what you pass on to your kids and so it's just trying to get people to open up to more than what we're doing everything that we show them is just a vehicle i love to, it to learn something better right you know and it's it's just really important to me that, that you see people like that yeah. and when you were talking about the energy i use <laughs> i use the example to I, i've said that same thing before to a player and i said if you don't believe me that energy is tangible yeah go home make your mom and dad mad and try to sit at dinner with them. And, and you, you can <laughs> you can't, feel that's that. That's a great you know, example. And, and, you know, yeah. if you've been married and totally. divorced, and you, you understand that totally. sitting in that room next oh, to that person, my and you're both stewing, and nobody wants to say a word because right. the next word is that match that's going to light that off. Right. And you can feel that tension. Right. You can literally feel that in the room. <laughs> I love and it. that's just, it's that's the only example you need to know. And if that works for negative energy, that works for positive energy too. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, they're there's all energy. There's always those people, you know, that regardless of what the situation, when they're there, the level of the room goes up right. just because of their spirit or because right. of their their lack of stress or the the jovity that they have for every Abs situation. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. The the cleaner and clearer, like whatever, let let stuff go. That was mm -hmm. the, again, that was a big part of my journey. And I, I can I still continue to this day. The more we evolve, the, the more there's there's little stuff to let go, and it, it you become a lot. You go through that letting go a lot easier when you mm -hmm. see it. You don't make it such a big. Oh my gosh, I was so stupid. I can't believe I did that. You're just like ease and grace. You know, that's <laughs> just I, I that just you become compassionate for yourself. Mm -hmm. Like that's who I was back then. I did based on what I knew, and now I know better. I'm just gonna let that old part of me go, mm -hmm. right? And so then you can continue to evolve, continue to have the positive impact and continue to go on and be productive in whatever else you still have in you to experience, mm -hmm. you know? How much of that do you think is age and wisdom? Well, I think a lot of it is age and wisdom. And, mm -hmm. and I will say, I feel like the younger generation is coming in a bit wiser because mm -hmm. Look at the information we were exposed to. Well, two things: the, how we were raised and the information we were exposed to. We, the newspaper and the radio, right, and whatever TV. Now there's like twenty four seven. You can get international. You can get all mm -hmm. this stuff. So I think kids are being born with just knowing a lot more stuff mm -hmm. and and being a, a bit more evolved than 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 we were. Sure. So so yes, definitely age and wisdom is is a is a part of it, but um I, I've met some pretty pretty wise and evolved 20 something year olds, 30 something year olds. And I'm mm -hmm. like, wow, when I was your age, yeah, I was pretty clueless. 
you know, so it is, it, things are shifting for sure. Mm -hmm. That's interesting too, because I've always been, I've always been a big fan of adversity. I'm, I'm always going to favor a person that has a rough story mm. as opposed to someone that had a really nice, you know, <laughs> only because I know that with yeah. that adversity, yeah, we can converse on a level div despite of our ages or okay. in spite of our age, because I know you've gone through some things. So yeah. the information you're relaying to me comes from experience. It doesn't come from, oh, I heard this or right. my mom said that. or my, You're not being fed that information. So when I come across people like that, I feel a little bit more apt to, to kind of help and converse with them because they have an idea of, I've already had to overcome some things, so I get where you're coming from, right. as opposed to someone, <laughs> you know, like you said, where you get those those kids that the parents do everything for them, they answer for them, they tell them when and where, and you know, it, it's funny now because a lot of times when I get the kids in and I'll ask them, hey, do you have a game this weekend? Do I have a game this weekend? <laughs> Yeah, you know, they, they really they literally don't know, you know, what oh, happened. Gosh. It's almost like you can just see yeah. that they're following the path. And, you know, those are those are things where I kind of look and think, you know, it's it's really in the society we're in. It is better to maybe let your kids venture out a little bit more because yeah. they're doing it on their phones. Right. In maybe not physically, but they're able to see things and they have access right. to things that, you know, maybe you thought they weren't ready for. Well, right. By what they can access, they're having to be ready for it. Yeah, so, but definitely. It's different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, adversity. Hmm. Yeah, well, those kids will face theirs at some point, I'm sure, right? Yeah, but I think you'll be prepared for it if you've already had some. Definitely, oh, you know? for sure. It's like, yeah, the bigger, the harder fall happens yeah. and uh, all of that. But regardless of when it happens, I think Again, it's that's everybody's divine path. So, sure. you know, I've I've chatted with the gals in my mastermind, and we all have very different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, or, I mean, I should, not very very different, but you know, some different experiences. And and some people, yeah, kind of had the school hard knocks younger. Some people it was old, later. And what whatever it was that we went through was our divine path. So. Um, just I think part of that acceptance that mm -hmm. wherever somebody is at, it, you know, is part of their journey. And I, I've had to do that with my kids because they're again, they're they're very different. And um, I, I feel like I can support whomever comes into my life better if I'm if I'm meeting them, you know, where where they're at mm -hmm. and not saying, oh, you know, they should be here. They should be there. And I, I sure. obviously, as a coach, we never say that anyway. Sure. But but just seeing, yeah, people that um, even even somebody that's struggling. And I, I've had conversations with friends that have you know had sons, and you know I don't know. If at least the sons we know seem to have gone through harder times. But um, not even to say I wish it didn't happen to them, mm -hmm. but to say um, you know. I think something good's going to come out of this, right? And and so energetically, I think just a little side tangent here. A lot of parents can get into that really place of their negative. As a parent, the negative energy. This kid is, you know, you yeah. hear all that stuff, and of course we don't. We, we want our kids to be on the straight and narrow, and we never want it. But how can how can we energetically? draw you know what draw their appropriate boundaries so we're not condoning the behavior but 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 have that mindset of again just like we do for ourselves there's a reason for mm -hmm. this like this something's going to come out of this and, and if i look at my son as an example like he he looks back at that that time and tough time in his life he's like wow i you know i can't believe that's who i was but let me tell you like looking back I never want to be that kind of person mm -hmm. again, right? So it's pushed him like, like trajectory because he he can feel how and see how he was back then. So yeah. I don't know, just a little tangent. <laughs> well, no, it makes sense because I think, and you've probably come across more people that you've mentored in this way, but from the experiences that I've had with people, we tend not to want to make changes until we hit rock bottom. Mm, yeah. And if we could just yeah, realize, hey, I you know, know what, I, I could stop here and go up, but we just, I think as people, we just kind of look, and that's that's true with people with addiction, with people with yeah. any kind of the se severe, severe things. You know, I'm not just talking about little mistakes, right. like, you know, overrunning your credit card or something, but um, we tend to always think, oh, I can come out of it, I can come out of it until you get to that point yeah. where 
I, I have to do something about yeah. this. Yeah. And I think if you start to, like you had mentioned before, internally reflect and understand what type of person you are and understand that, you know, I'm an addictive type of personality or, you know what, I tend to gravitate towards these type of people or men right. and women in my life and, right. and these people take me down this path. You become more aware and you keep yourself from those rock Absolutely. bottom those rock 100%. Bottom points. Yeah. Right. And and part of that is being able to take take that pause. And again, we get so into that busyness of life, just the go, go, go. Because I will tell you, there were many times I heard that little voice and I refused to stop and face it. <laughs> yeah. Like, it, again, we just... The fear, we don't know what, you know, we, we, we sense it's going to really change things and we're not ready to, you know, we just don't have the confidence to deal with the, with the consequences. Again, whatever it is, whatever path somebody is taking, it's, um, if, if they keep going, eventually they're going to get to that place of awareness where they're going to be able to stop themselves. So they might yeah. have to, you know, fall a few times before they they choose to not fall again, yeah, you know? Yeah. And it doesn't even have to be rock bottom, but you're right, a lot of people do, hit, I mean, hit rock bottom for sure. Yeah, uh, that, that self-awareness is really key. It's tough to, yeah. it's actually tough to teach self-awareness. Ah. You know, I, I think I found more people that just, for whatever reason, they've paid attention to the things they've done in the past and they've made those adjustments. Yeah. Or there's the people that really don't understand. Right. They continually to make the, continue to make those mistakes over and over. Right. And you you see it from the outside as a totally. friend, or is it? You know, but they, you can't. Yeah. You don't want to tell them. No, you don't want to tell them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 They um, there's something I was going to say. Well, this is the other thought is so I have a grandbaby. She's almost four now, okay. and I, I'm teaching her stuff. Right. So <laughs> you know, back in the day, it was like don't cry. You know how how I was raised like don't cry you know the just listen to this and now it's like okay use your words and i don't know that i even use that with my kids like how are you feeling so i, I helped her name something one day it's maybe a like she was even early threes mm -hmm. and um i she was like starting to throw a little bit of a fit and i said are you frustrated and she looked at me and she's like yes, I'm frustrated. I'm like, good, thank you for, you know. So like the more we can help the kids. Again, I was judged for having my emotions. We were taught, sure. um, you know, sad, unhappy emotions were wrong. Even my daughter, I know we had conversations about this as an adult and she said, yeah, I, I, I just don't like my emotions. I go, well, there's nothing <laughs> wrong with them, but we were chastised. We were sure. put down, we we're meant to feel shameful for feeling a certain way. So. Again, this is all part of the evolution that we're in. The more we become aware as adults and we can help our children and then the grandchildren and, and, and pretty soon everybody has this different level of awareness, right? Yeah. So it takes time and, you know, even my dad's got some awareness too. I mean, he's, he just turned 89. So, <laughs> so the more, the more that we can, again, pause and face it without judgment then then I mean even some of those other things won't even happen right, right. so why, why is the person addicted to spending money because they're you know there was some pattern they learned or there's something they didn't that mom or dad didn't teach them so now they're they're stuffing emotions they're mm -hmm. stuffing what they really truly need and they're trying to medicate by spending sure. money yeah well that's the, I was gonna say that when you mentioned that earlier we talked about the things that were pre-programmed yeah you know when you talk about asking someone what do you want or what makes you happy a lot of times I'm, I'm willing to bet that those are tangible things or they are actually items you know yes, house material. boat yeah, material that's the word i was looking for yeah they they're a tie they're tied to their happiness right you know if i only had this house if i was only able to live here instead of here if i was only able to like you mentioned yeah. work this job that job and it's just it, it's weird how that became kind of a band-aid for things absolutely absolutely again i think it goes back to that the cultural conditioning so the more we have these kinds of conversations mm -hmm. and n none of that material stuff is bad right it's 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 fun it's like I, you know i have when i moved i had re i sold all my old stuff because it didn't even fit with the style of where i was moving to and so i actually had an interior de decorator help me do stuff and my house is this beautiful really peaceful place and i beauty is beautiful right mm -hmm. so having things a car that we 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 feel safe in and we we like to look at or feels mm -hmm. whatever like 
there's nothing wrong with having those material things. I think it's where we think it's the end all, right? right. So that's that's that ga- that's the gap that a lot of people have. And you're right. Probably you ask somebody what makes you happy, and that's going to be their first reaction mm-hmm. because we weren't taught to listen to what your heart. You know, I remember when I was in, in corporate, and I found this book, and it said, "Do what you love, and the money will follow." And I, at the time, I was married, and. I went and showed it with, to my then husband, and he laughed at me. He's like, ah, "Do what you love. That's just BS. Whatever, <laughs> you know." And I'm like, "No, like I feel like I feel this. Like I was already starting to feel that in my, even though my corporate job was steady and stable and all that stuff. Like it just wasn't me. It wasn't. Mm-hmm. It wasn't." You know, kind of what you were starting to feel with the coaching stuff. Like there was something else for me to experience. So, um, but and I was open to it. But that just the sound of that, do what you love. Like really, I could do what I love, and I still have a good income. And um, th- again, that's now what we're seeing with these kids that you know that are yeah. living these these lives, which um, you know seems pretty surreal for some of them to. Yeah. Well, I mean, and it's it's good for them because it's creativity. It's, you know, for so long you go back to, you know, a few generations ago, if you were artistic or you had creativity right. as, as your bend, you couldn't make money at it. You hear the term starving artist, yes. <laughs> you know, now you can sell art on TV or on TV, on YouTube and on Instagram, and you can sell digital art and you can do things online and, and make animation and, you know, right. any of that creativity, there's so many ways now to make that your life's work or to make that your living. Right. Where before you were, again, if you weren't in an art gallery or you weren't a writer and you wrote 50 books and you had to go through, and which I'm gonna touch on next. (laughs) Yes, perfect, that's where I'm leaving you. You know, you, because when we were talking about it before, I'm I'm gonna willing to guess that you probably really thought that writing a book 10 years ago was impossible. Yeah, 10 years ago. Um, It might've been a glimmer in my eye 10 years ago. Mm Um, but maybe the mountain to climb to yeah, get that oh, book right, right. was a little higher. Well, so here's here's something about me. And again, everybody's different. Like I'll have these ideas and I'll know there's certain things I know. I know I'm going to do that at some point in my life. I just don't know when. Okay. And so writing a book was one of those things. When I, I don't know, some point in my in my coaching career, it, it definitely was within the last 10 years. I, I just had a sense, uh, or, or I don't know if it was a sense or a desire or, or, or what, but I'm like, I, I, there's something, I want to write a book someday. I don't know what it'll be about or when I'll do it. And so, um, but that seed was always there. So I, I think, again, if we start to pause, we can, we can connect with those old seeds that we planted um, maybe years ago mm-hmm. type of thing. So that was definitely a seed that was there. And... I didn't know when it was going to happen. So I, as a coach, and I was rebranding, and I was going to write what what people call your signature program. Mm-hmm. So this is that core offering you have that you bring people in, You they go through multiple weeks program, and that's kind of your the main meat of your business. So I started to... I started to work on that and I actually hired somebody who like had this really cool system to help you do it very efficiently, blah, blah, blah. And I started to work with her. I'm like, no, I don't think I want to write my core program. I think I want to write my book because she also did the book. And it was just, again, one of those things that it just kind of came to me like this might be the time. So that's when I, that's when I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. But the her the methodology was it was very structured and very fast and it was seven weeks and my book was written. Wow. Yeah. And and then I'm like, I can't publish this. I'm not ready to publish this. Like that then there's it's one thing to write the book, but there's a whole nother like job of like getting it ready to be uh, getting it edited and formatted and then are you gonna self publish? Are you gonna go with the publisher? All these things. So I put the book down. I'm like, yeah, it's there. I'll come back to it. But, mm-hmm. you know, and again, that's just me. Some people might have just pushed through and, and got it out there. Somebody would have, I didn't, energetically, like I'm more of a short spurt kind of person. So it sat for a year. And I went on to take kind of what I what I learned, what I did there, and then I brought it into a program. And so I went back to the coaching piece. But it was always there. And then all of a sudden it would just like bubble up. I'm like, Okay, 
enough you need to bring you got you know mm-hmm. i don't know if it's because it was such a vulnerable thing for me because the book is based on so it's called radiant achievement mm-hmm. and it's me teaching um a new approach to achievement and again this was this was my story of how it was that structured achievement you create a project plan you write your action steps and you go and you just check them off whatever obstacle you just figure a way to work around it and it was just that push that push till you're done type mm-hmm. of thing and it, that's great for certain projects home improvement you know things that are kind of repetitive mm-hmm. but for these inner callings these inner some of these inner deeper things sure. there is no you don't do a project plan so i saw in my life how i reoriented and and let myself come from that in place of intuition inspiration let things come to me in their timing i didn't always push for stuff to happen and yes i created plans but it was more a blend of feminine energy and masculine energy and so that's what the book is about Mm -hmm. and so that is truly how i i intentionally live my life with this blended energy of inspiration inner the inner guidance and then with the outer action so I, I teach it i share my stories in the book but when i picked it back up that second time i cried when i read the book and i'm like this is kindergarten material like it sounds so <laughs> lame oh my gosh like a year later like i so i evolved even more and i'm like i like i was ready to scrap the whole project and i was working with a coach at a time and she read she said okay it's a great foundation you just need to add some more to it Mm -hmm. so i took like chapter by chapter i went back in and i just added like okay how can i add more stories or give more details or add more you know um at the end of every chapter is our question or here's some things you can do some practices activities that i did to help me really embody this i call them power so Mm -hmm. like owning owning your self-worth like we think I'm confident and I love myself, but if you start peeling back the layers, like so many people are coming from a place of low self-esteem, not real, like I'm not enough, I'm I'm not good enough, I'm not lovable, whatever. So, so it dives deep into mm-hmm. here's some here's things to really kind of get clear on that. So I went through and I had it, um, I added more to it and then I had a gal, a friend of mine who's a writer, she did some editing and boy, whoo, she, oh, that was, that was hard to digest. Mm -hmm. That was a whole nother thing. So, you know, you're kind of in and then you get the result and then you're like, I'm out. Like I can't, you know, I can't handle all this right now. And again, I, I, I just honored, I was going to take it with, 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 its own timing and I would give myself what I needed and if I needed an emotional break a mental break uh, you know I would walk away and then I I started to say okay what how can I set myself up for success so one of the ways was I blocked my time and I left my house to write and I went to a coffee shop and I would sit there for a three-hour block of time and I and I scheduled it out and that consistency outside of my home but again being in wonder of okay how can I keep myself in the most positive energy to keep moving forward I listened to piano music like I really had my little Zen thing going sure. on and it wasn't just about toughing it out right we don't we don't have to do that so I got through all those edits and then I put it down one more time because there's also a cycle to publishing books, right? right. Like you don't want to do it at in the summertime and, and things like that. So I, I I picked it back up, dusted it off. I had to re the last the holdup was I needed to revamp the first the beginning of the book. It was too long. I didn't I didn't it didn't feel right. It just the energetically was off. So I connected with one more person again. How okay? What do I need to do? You know, curiosity and wonder to get this thing moving forward again and um, connected with a gal who's an editor, uh, a different type of editor, and she she helped me f- polish it off. Then I was like, I was ready to go. So, uh, in fact, I had already purchased this self-publishing package from from a publisher, mm-hmm. and it, it sat there for like nine months. Like, they're, they were ready for me to submit my manuscript. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I have one more thing to do, and that was the beginning. So, so now it's it's uh, in process, but again, some people 
would you know i don't want anyone to judge me for how long it took or, or how many times i put it down that was my journey and did, i learned a lot of things about myself along the way and i was able to not just do the book but i was able to evolve mm -hmm. and and that's the thing with every one of these goals that we say yes to is who do we become mm -hmm. as a part of that journey so you step out courageously you write a book you do a podcast you do some new project it's about who you get to become right be and as well as the product mm -hmm. so so right around may 19th i will be publishing this book and I am excited for it to finally, <laughs> energetically, because we carry that with us, right? Mm -hmm. So it, I think I'll lose five pounds when I have that book published. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that's, I think that's probably the best way to go about it. Because like we had talked about, if you look 30 years ago, if I want to write a book, there's a timeline, in it, there's pressure to it. Yeah. And I lose the joy of the journey yeah. because I have to write this book because I committed to an editor, I committed to. So there's that timeline and I have to submit it whether I feel 100% good about it or not. For you, all of these things that you're doing, I've started to gather that it has really nothing to do with the actual journey, right. it's with the thing itself, right. the podcast, the, the mentoring. It's how you become a different person by doing all of these things. And those are all just stopping points because they're going to lead you to something else. 100% Ernie, <laughs> so 100%. That's, so the book for you, you know, I'm thinking you're probably going to write a second one. Yeah. And it's going to be about something totally different yeah. than the first one because your first one was getting things out yes. and into the book and on paper, part of your, the different ways that you respond to things, you know, verbal, visual, things like that. So now you're going to have a different journey through writing this book mm -hmm. and putting this book out is just who you are at this point. Yeah. And in five years, you're going to be a different person and you'll have things to go back and, and write about in there. And so that's probably the best way to go about doing it. And if there's no pressure to put it out, then there's no pressure. Right. Because you're not a writer per se. It's no. just something that I did. Right. But I don't want to be forced to not enjoy it. Right. Exactly. Thank you. That's yeah. a huge point and and then every time when i stopped and 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 it was sitting there and i had my accountability group my mastermind and they say so or my or a coach like so i kind of flop between the two so where are you at on that book i'm like mm -hmm. yeah i'm not quite ready or or whatever they would periodically check in with me and, and i knew mm -hmm. i had this safe space when i was ready to take that next step to, because it was about it was a, wasn't about finishing the book it was mm -hmm. about me and it was there's some resistance some story some thing i wasn't owning um that i needed to let go of True. right and or step into mm -hmm. right like step into you are a good writer mm -hmm. and just own that mm -hmm. about yourself, you know, because you start, comp you know, was I comparing myself to sure. other people and, and all of that. So, so um, yeah, again, just owning that I was, I was willing to um, take, peel back those layers very slowly, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I was, but I knew I was going to peel back the layers. I was yeah. I, like one big thing I've changed in my life. I was so afraid to peel back the layers or peek behind the curtain to see what was really there. And now like, like bring it on like i i will go you know to the bottom of the ocean to figure it out it just i'm going to honor the timing and 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 take care of myself along the way mm -hmm. so so the the content for the book how long do you think you put time into it and I'm just trying to, from my end, I'm thinking, yeah. okay, you know, I, I've thought about it before. And when I yeah. had Yesenia in here that she wrote the children's book and she was telling me about the <clears throat> the self-publishing she did. And then I said, oh, you know, what? I don't want to write a book. Oh, yeah. <laughs> was, you know, it's like you think about it, you write it down, you hand it, someone puts a pad on it and then it's out. It doesn't work that way. No. They go through it, they go through it, they go through it. And so when I asked her about it, I said, how hard was it? Because now she's at the point where she's, I guess, in essence, um, promoting the book yes and the goal wasn't monetary but she said you know i had expenses that i had to put into it so for me i look at it like okay well at this point i probably have enough content to write a book yeah. but do i want to go through all the process to get it out right maybe there's another way to do it you know maybe now with facebook and instagram and things like yeah. that you know you can do it in different blurbs or you know you can talk to people about different subjects that would be in your book and you don't necessarily have to put True. pen to paper there's so so many ways and and i will say 
it, it's kind of like it reminds me when I was having when I was pregnant with my daughter and someone gave me a pregnancy book and I was three months pregnant and I started looking at what happens at month eight and nine and I closed the book I'm like <laughs> I can't look at that yet I'm not there right, right. so I, again this is a one way we shut ourselves down mm -hmm. connect with the calling connect if you're feeling the stirring to write the book that's the only thing right now you need to focus on is you know what might I, how might I set myself up to to put down on paper in an organized fashion all these ideas and thoughts and wisdom that I have mm -hmm. Don't even think about that other piece. That you know, we, we drive ourselves crazy when we try and go twenty steps down the road and have that's the strategic mm -hmm. way. Yeah, having it all figured out because there's there's all kinds of ways you can do it at that end. And once you go through the writing, then you're gonna be more open based on what you created to know this is how I want to go with it. You right. might want to pitch it to a publisher and do nothing. You might want to. I've heard people who wrote their first book in blog posts. They took one blog, one whatever section mm -hmm. was a blog post and they did it for like a year and then that was their book. Mm -hmm. You can do an, you can do just a book in a PDF form and never even have it um, you know published and just you can sell it online just in a P, your own PDF yeah. form without even and just do the ISBN without even a fancy format. So there's like the technology these days, it's unlimited. Yeah. And you can be as simple or as fancy as you want based on what you're feeling called to do. So I ended up g going with a self publisher. And I, I thought, you know, at that point, I went through all the gamut. I talked to one publisher and, and that didn't feel right. I looked at the different self publishing arms. And I'm a big Hay House person. They're mm -hmm. like big self improvement. And they have a self publishing division called Balboa Press. I'm like, well, that's as close to Hay House as I can get. And I've heard if the books, they look at the Hay, at the Balboa Press authors, and if a book is selling really well, they might offer you to republish it as a Hay House author. It's, it's okay. a very small percentage, but I'm like, for me, for whatever reason, that was important to me. So that's the way I went. Sure. But all that other stuff will come, you know, in time. But yeah. I, I guarantee you've got a great book in you <laughs> as long as you've worked with kids and all the wisdom mm -hmm. and, and all of that. So Well, it's funny because as you were talking about it, I'm like, I spun myself into one of your clients. I'm, <laughs> I'm, thinking, I'm thinking about the book. I'm like, well, who's going to read it? I'm going to put all these hours into <laughs> oh, it. And, brother. and I'm going to have 14 boxes in my garage of my own book that nobody, I'm going to end up giving them away. And, yeah. you know, I'd rather just take everybody that's going to end up buying them to dinner and let them listen to me tell stories. <laughs> but um, it, you know, it's funny, as you were saying that, I'm, I can count the roadblocks going up to all, yes, the, all the stuff in see? there, which is funny how it works. Yeah, but it was something now that, that you have I'd the always, awareness of it. <laughs> yeah, so it's funny how I start self-analyzing myself. Um, question I did have to you yes. was, uh, I love San Diego. I love the area. How did you go from... Riverside to San Diego, or even better, was where was Riverside? Where were you before Riverside? Right in San Diego. I, oh, okay. <laughs> well, then that makes sense there because it's yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, it, we were in San Diego, but one of the things that was important to me was that for the kids to grow up around family. So my then husband's family is all up here in Riverside, and River. For a while, the company he worked for had an office in Riverside. Mm. So we were like, oh, let's just have him transfer to that office. Gotcha. The kids will be here. We'll, we'll you know, raise them. And then at some point, we'll go back down to San Diego. So right before we decided to move here, they closed that office. But he said, you know what? I'll, I'll just commute. So he commuted for six years. God bless him for that. And it was fantastic. So the kids, you know, we had such a tight-knit family environment, which mm -hmm. was important to me. Sure. And then he got promoted to partner, and my kids were entering high school, and we knew it was time to move back down to San Diego. So um, I, I always wanted to live close to the beach. Mm -hmm. And I've, I'm a water person. I mean, I might not be in the water, but I love walking by the water. And so with, with all of my transitions, I, it's funny because we ended up having it bought, buying this fixer upper in uh, a nice area, Rancho Santa Fe. And we had done a lot of fix, fixer upper, a lot of self home improvement work, our whole marriage. And he's like, I'm not sure if you're ready for one more project. And none of the other houses that I had found really sat with him. So I'm like, yeah, it's a great area. Let's do this one more project. And I remember when we were, we were having, um, I was having a really tough time at one point, and I said, "We're just on the treadmill. Like, I, 
let, let's just sell this and go buy a condo by the beach and just be able to walk places, have this carefree life. Like it just, there was so much stress and pressure. And, and he looked me at, in the eyes and said, this is our life. And I just like, my heart just sank. Like, like I felt like stuck, right? And obviously I could have chose sure. to do something and I, I didn't, but anyway, I have a condo by the beach. It's mm -hmm. not, I can see the ocean. I'm not at the beach, but I'm a mile, one mile from the beach. And that's, that was perfect for me. So ultimately I, you know, I really got what my, what my heart wanted, which was this beautiful sure. little Zen place. But you know, the way there was not ideal. Yeah. So did you grow up in San Diego? No, I'm actually from Wisconsin. Oh, okay. That well, makes... I'm a Milwaukee girl. <laughs> okay. No, I, that's that's not. It's different. Yeah. It's different from, yeah. So when did you move out? So uh, did so you go to school in Wisconsin? I did. I went to college in Wisconsin. Um, so um, it's kind of the Goldilocks story. So Wisconsin was too cold. Mm -hmm. Then I moved to Arizona. It's still too cold. It is still too cold. <laughs> um, I had heard that there were great opportunities in IT, information technology, That's that was my career. So I ended up moving to Scottsdale, Arizona. I worked four years at Motorola's Government Electronics Group. Okay. But Arizona's too hot. Like, oh my <laughs> goodness, 122 degrees. 100, 108 degrees was the average temperature in July. I hate air conditioning. I, I, or I dislike, I shouldn't say hate. Mm -hmm. I don't like using that word. I dislike air conditioning. It just, I, I get stuffy. I don't sleep well. You can never regulate the temperature. And a friend of mine had had um, one summer um, e a weekend. We went to San Diego. We drove to San Diego, and it was at night. We were in the backseat of her parents' car. Uh, I'm in my mid twenties now, and or late, I guess yeah, later twenties and mid to late twenties. We I, so I'm kind of not even paying attention. We get to our hotel, get checked in, wake up in the morning, open the these cool crank out windows. I think we're at the Hotel Dell in Coronado. <laughs> And I almost, my jaw hit the floor. I'm like, where are we? This is San Diego. Walked around Seaport Village. Like mm -hmm. I knew this is my new home. Right. And serendipitously, a gal I was working with in Arizona had just transferred to San Diego. Her husband was in the Navy. And I called her up and I said, what's the scoop? You know, like other jobs. And she, so within six months, I moved to San Diego. She wow. said, yeah, there's jobs here. And and when I hit San Diego, I'm like, this is home. It truly felt like home for me. So again, it was one of those things. I, Wisconsin was not me. And I knew I, for my, my health and well-being, I could not continue to stay there after college. And so every, in those early days, like I was really good until I became a mom. Like I was really good at honoring what was calling to me. <laughs> <laughs> then those mom genes kicked in and I, you know. So how old were you when you moved from Wisconsin? Uh, I was 22. Okay. No, 20, yeah, it was right before my 22nd birthday. Mm -hmm. And I knew one, one person in Arizona and then I knew one person in San Diego, but I was open. That's pretty good. I only detected a couple <laughs> pieces of the accent there. But uh, usually I can pick those out pretty good. But, um, you know, usually when you're in your 20s, when you leave, it's hard to lose that, yes. uh, that upper Midwest accent. Yes. No, I, I had it for a long time. I think it's actually only been in the cu last couple of years that I really noticed people aren't saying, where are you from? <laughs> like, you, you sound like you're from the Midwest. They might mm -hmm. say Chicago or something like yeah. that. But it's just, I don't a, get it's just that a little often. bit. No, you don't. Oh, I mean, I, I've, I know some people that have been here longer and you still hear it. Mm. in pretty much every sentence. Yeah. Yours, it's a few words here and there that I know aren't natural Cal <laughs> native, native Californian. Native Californian, yeah. Yeah, if that's such a thing. But um, so, I mean, that's just I was off the subject because yeah, I, you know, when good. I see your posts and stuff, because I always enjoy going down there. If it was, you know, something that I actually had an opportunity to do, that would probably be where I would like to sell. But I love Arizona. That's the mm. hard part. <laughs> I, I love, you know. And there's a lot from, of baseball there too, right? Yeah, that's the other thing. I mean, I'm, I can kind of I I like the ability in California to kind of go wherever you want to go, change climates. Mm -hmm. Even though I don't really like the snow and I don't ski, I just kind of like to know if I wanted to, I could. Um, you know, I like the proximity of the Inland Empire, just kind of where I grew up. I kind of like the toughness of it. Mm. I, that's that's a yeah. little more me. I like that. You know, everyone here has got a little chip on their shoulder, and they're everyone's trying to to get out of the Inland Empire. So there's a little bit more fight than some other uh. places, but. Um, you know, you can get to San Diego, you can get to Los Angeles, you can get to Orange County, and all are like their own little states, you know, so there's that diversity Def that you don't get, yeah. you know, and Arizona, I don't think from 
Palm Desert out to Arizona. I don't think there's a more beautiful area for me anyway from October through January. Mm. I mean that that's the nice part of it. Now June, yeah, ju- <laughs> June, I July, and August. It's, yeah, <laughs> it, but it's just one of those things where uh. I've been fortunate through baseball. We're always out in Arizona in October, November, December, and it's gorgeous absolutely you know where other places are cold you know you're sitting out on the patio it's 85 degrees it's you know so it's just one of those things where i I don't i think i could be happy living anywhere but those i kind of seem to to favor and then now you're getting to that point when your bones feel a little bit better when it's hot yes (laughs) (laughs) the aches and pains go away when it's a little but Uh, it's just curious how you know i've met some people recently that have come to, to work with me and they, well we just moved up here from san diego well, why stay oh, there wow, <laughs> you right. were there well you know? it was funny the kids when we moved we moved so we moved back and then they still were coming up here for the uh their orthodontic appointments oh, it was okay. like once a month or whatever i remember one summer smoggy summer day hotter <laughs> than you know what yeah. and the kids get here and they're like mom why did we ever live here <laughs> and then now they've been in san diego and sure. my son's surfing now and whatever and um you know my, it was family and it was perfect it was just that perfect thing for you know yeah what i was wanting to create for the family so you're back in san diego now don't worry <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, it's beautiful down there I'm, I'm actually happy for it but i had no idea the wisconsin thing that's, yeah. that's interesting mm-hmm. yeah and congrats on the accent you were able thank to, you yeah <laughs> to push that aside. but um so now the next thing we are going to start a podcast yes so if you i don't know how much you want to sure let go or, yeah. or talk about and, and you did say that someone had given you an idea yeah. for an avenue of a podcast so i'll share it a little okay. bit yeah so i've actually recorded four six six or seven episodes and it, it actually was sparked when i started writing my book because one section in the book i talk about radiant leaders mm-hmm. and these are all women there's five women i interviewed that really had stepped into their calling in a big way and they've they're living their legacy kind of thing right okay. so i in, i interviewed them and um and so that was the start going to be the start of my podcast well you know that was two years ago when i sure. interviewed them right so it's it's all good it's all but that my, my that was the initial thought when that seed was planted again it sat on the shelf and then i have been part of well i have an app which um it, then i in the app i want to be able to have my content all in one place mm-hmm. so instead of people seeing certain things on instagram and facebook lives on facebook and you know content here there sure. everywhere i i want to have one vehicle so so my intention is with the the podcast you can have the video and the audio um um just have it in my app so i started okay now now the book is well on its way it's going to be publishing now is the time to to rejuvenate and start making moving forward with the podcast so so what it's about and it's going to be video too so i'm mm-hmm. going to post it both ways so i want to showcase for women and i i will interview men too actually like what what does what calling are they following how did they come to hear and say yes to that calling what obstacles have they had to overcome mm-hmm. who are they becoming right mm-hmm. how have they changed how has their life changed as a result of saying yes and you know what what wisdom could they pass on to somebody who's maybe not said yes mm-hmm. I've, i love doing these interviews it's so much fun and so so what the little twist though that might happen is I tend to be very perky, positive, like, which is which is great. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, I think there's a lot of power in something you said earlier in vulnerability. Mm-hmm. So yes, I, like my I I do so love my life, and at the same time, it doesn't mean I don't have challenges, right? It doesn't mean that I didn't come through a lot of challenges. So let's kind of let's peel back. Let's you know peel back. Sh- move that current and talk about what you know mm-hmm. who were you before like let's talk that before and after and you know so for me you know yeah i love my life now but the truth is i was miserable and i was a, I, I i felt like a shell of a woman for so many years because i wasn't loving myself and i was projecting that on my kids and my then husband right mm-hmm. so so we can look at you know like that hero's journey and here's where you are now but 
let's talk about when you were stuck in this cycle of self-denial of of self you know lack of self-respect or whatever so it's to it's to bring in a deeper layer of talking about the not so pretty things because part of what I think we need to give more energy to is that it's okay. It's what you sure. talked about earlier. It's okay to face mm -hmm. whatever it is that you're facing. It doesn't mean you're not a you're not a worthy person or that you can't have a beautiful, productive, successful, abundant life. Mm -hmm. So when we start to make it safe and okay and we see people sharing, you know, whatever that deep, you know, to the degree degree they want to go there, sharing that deep that deep side that is vulnerable, I think that's the piece that can be even better than just the cheery side, sure. which is the way I tend to go. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, from from a, uh, a church or a religious standpoint, they call those testimonies, yeah. you know, the people that have overcome. And yeah. just like in business, you know, they talk about that old poster with the iceberg, you know, everyone just sees the top yes. and all the success, yes. but you have all these people that you bring on and, you know, if you came in after all of the, the heartache, right. you only see the success and you think they had this red carpet life right. and things just happened for them and, and you don't realize all the adversity. Right. And so I think that's actually, I think a lot of people not necessarily enjoy that, but that's where they gain the most knowledge. I agree. And, and, and you know, not that we feel good about it, but as a person or people when we're in adversity we feel a little bit better knowing that other people have come through it like us yeah because when you get into hard times you always feel like it's only happening to right. me or i'm the only right. one that's suffering or i'm the right. only one that's going through this right and and i'm never going to get out of this right. this is just my fate right. right right this is just so you can hear somebody whose story was and i can't tell you how many times i've heard somebody's story that was 10 times worse you right. know whatever than mine i'm like oh my gosh like yeah. Totally. I'm, I'm just like going to zip my lip. I have mm -hmm. nothing to even complain about or cry about mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever. It's like, I get it, you yeah. know, so definitely. Yeah. And, and, I, and I go there with people. I have them talk about an obstacle, but I think it's it, it will be a little bit of a bigger focus of the, the, the hardships they faced or the, the revelation, you know, yeah. that, that they ended up making. And I, one of my talks, I talk about my radiant shifts, mm -hmm. like, because I, I, did shift in many, many ways. So I talk about some of the significant ones and it's that, it's it's coming to that vulnerable, that that truly honest place with yourself, mm -hmm. right. right? Where where no one is gonna um, judge you or, or tell you did something wrong, but just when you can be that honest with yourself, like I was the one doing it to me, yeah. right? I was the one staying in the marriage or I was the one continuing to blah 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 whatever the case may be it's it's that point i think is that's the the power for people to hear it's like mm -hmm. holy shit like <laughs> how where am i showing up in my life where i'm giving giving my power away right, right? so right. um yeah so we'll we'll see she and i have to dive into it a little bit more but i'm chewing on some stuff <laughs> <laughs> well it's interesting that the terminology used and i, I think just depending on your perspective, you know, we refer to it as vulnerability. Yes. But I think the word vulnerability comes from our upbringing where you didn't have emotions. Yes. But if you look at it from another point of view, it's being real with someone. It's being or real. I'm just being open with you. you Absolutely. Know, it's not vulnerable because I'm not, you know, I may be ashamed of some of the things that I've done, but I'm willing to share it. Right. To help you get better or to maybe offer you an, an, an option to see a way out. Right. So you can call it vulnerability, I think, if yeah. you're trying to hide it or you don't want to let it out. And so I guess just depending on your perspective. Yes. So it's funny how we, you know, our kind of the background of the conversation has been comparing how we are now to how we were mm -hmm. logged in as, as upbringing. And now you look at just little terms like that, yes. how that changes our whole <laughs> mindset of things. You yes. Know? And, and the first thought of, for example, writing a book, Yeah. you know, you might have one perception that it's going to take so much work to do it and it's going to take yeah. me years to do it. And then someone that's done it, they're like, oh, yeah, it's not that big a deal. I just had the script and I do this, this and this. So wherever you're coming from, I think, really defines uh, your outlook on things. Oh, for good, sure. Yeah. And it defines your experience, right? Yeah. I had um, – so here's a perfect example. Um, one of my clients um, – had a lot of projects um, and the message was, and I was going through my home improve, my remodel. And I was, 
uh, I had a schedule. Mm-hmm. We wa- I walked through with the contractor, everything. Here's the timing. My daughter's coming home, and I need time to get the furniture in. So your project needs to be done by this date, right? <laughs> and I started planning in advance. Mm-hmm. He's like, yep. You know how construction stuff goes. Sure. There's always delays. But I, from the start, said it's going to be finished on time. You know, we have a great rapport. We're going to work through everything in a timely fashion. Like, I just energetically, I, I put myself there. Things absolutely came up, but my client was like, oh, gosh, like, good luck. And it was like this this doom and gloom, like, yeah. you know, doom and gloom. And I just chose to, that's your experience that you're choosing. That's not the experience I'm choosing. Sure. And definitely we had multiple things that came up. Or you, There's, you know, you peel back ceilings and what pipes and whatever and there's going to be surprises but we were able to keep the schedule mm-hmm. and in in and I, it was again it was who i was being through that process that i had the joy and the flow and i wasn't in this demanding like oh my gosh you got to whatever because then energetically that changes things so sure. um yeah just a little story about that <laughs> How we set ourselves up, how we set ourselves up. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of self talk, like you said. If you're po- sure. if you're positive, then that's what's going to do. Sure. You know, there's. I'm I'm thinking of a ton of quotes. I'm a typical guy. You know, you watch yeah. all these movies. And I guess the, the ones I'm taking from are, are positive. But you know, one of the things that I had a coach that used to tell me all the time, if whatever you think you are, you are. Yes. You know, if you if you say you can, you can. If you say exactly. you can't, you can't. There's a book you know, about and, that, about yeah. that, And I'd hear them tell people, you know, a kid would come up, well, I, ju- I just can't hit the curveball or whatever. And you go, you're right. Mm-hmm. And, yep. the, and the guy would look at him like, well, that's not what you're <laughs> supposed to tell me. I'm like, well, as long as you keep saying you're not going to hit it, you're not. And I can't change that. Right. You know, I can change it when you tell me right. that you're ready to work on it or I think I can do it or I'm right. looking for options. You know, if I'm open, then I can help you. But right. if, if you've already closed it off to, totally. I can't do it, then we have nothing to talk about totally yeah. totally and yeah. you just all these little things from from baseball or athletics you start looking at it as rah rah at one point yeah and now you look back and go well yeah that made sense right you know well and i think too because i've had this conversation with one of my one of my clients when we have such deep-seated beliefs right. you can't go from a to z right and, and because it's just not your your whole psyche is just going to discount it right mm-hmm. it's not going to come in right so what would be the next thing that would be a true statement that you know would be moving you forward so you have to you can start with those baby baby steps and and so yeah a lot of people um discount affirmations because oh that's just bs like it you know so so part of what i teach number one is frame it so it, it's a it's a stretch but it's it's not that far off mm-hmm. that you, you're going to totally discount it and then a lot of the other thing and this was pivotal for me as a person in my healing journey is when i said my affirmations i felt the feeling that was associated with that so whether it's love or joy or peace or or bliss or happiness and how again we we I saw front and center how disconnected I had become mm-hmm. from fully feeling joy in my body, fully feeling love in my body. So I, I was doing for a lot of um, long stretch of time, and in fact, I had a product that came out of that, was I would um, look in the mirror mm-hmm. and I would tell myself I love you and I would say something positive that I love and appreciate about myself. And then I would read these affirmations and I would feel the, that positivity it was very awkward very strange just looking in the mirror at first mm-hmm. was strange but i would close my eyes and then you know just if we could like think of a, a grandchild or a child or somebody we loved we can immediately put ourselves into a feeling state of love sure so if you even have to think of somebody else one of my friends thinks of her her horse that she used to have to, to start triggering her to feel that love that again it's an energy so we can we can build that within ourselves the affirmation's going to stick it's going to sure. start to fire and wire things together for us yeah so that's interesting you know what i'm actually thinking and i was telling you earlier that and you had asked me why but the division of the baseball and the softball mm-hmm. part of it um I, because i think it is important for and again this was something i talked about with all of the coaches how trying to relate it to the students or the, the players that come through and and they realize it once they get to to be involved with these guys on a daily basis at the coaching level or at like um the private schools azusa pacific or you know where you're more of a faith-based background yeah. and they see it more as a mentorship 
and more of a family background. Not that the other ones aren't, because all the coaches have the same same heart for the, the boys and trying to mentor them to be men, teach them how to do more than, than just that and do the right thing. Because they're essentially living with them for four years. Yeah. And you become a, a second father to a lot of them or third father, whatever the situation is. So I, I think something like what you do would be beneficial to a lot of girls. Just totally. because I think now from being at the middle school level and, and looking at what goes on with some of these girls oh. um you know and, and i've talked to to women teachers and, and our counselors and things and they've done a great job where they've started well prior to covid they started a i think it was once a month they would have a saturday for any of the girls on mm -hmm. campus that wanted to come and they would have, have like an open forum and i had told them i go that's a great idea because you're all college educated women you're all in successful positions you're all in positions of of power so right. to speak where you can have Authority, influence yeah. on, and things like that and i i tried to get some of the, the the men now that we have to do that i said because part of what i see is and it's having a daughter and a wife and a sister and you know i see the way that some of these 13 14 year old boys talk to mm -hmm. the girls and the way the girls respond to it or the way that they don't respond yeah. to it. And I think it's something <clears throat> that just, there's a disconnect mm -hmm. in the culture now. And then again, I'm only on one campus, so it's probably gonna vary yeah. from, from, but I think just in general that I think the younger girls, and, and you know this too from social media and from oh, it's advertising, it's been this way for years. I think the more <laughs> things that they can, can see that are positive rather than emphasizing appearance and, and makeup and status and likes Absolutely. and you know all the different clothing things that clothing and, yeah. yeah i think it's more critical now than ever yeah just because you know the, the way things are they get feedback from people they don't even know right you know their, right. their goal is to have so many friends on TikTok or instagram and do you really know ten thousand people yeah <laughs> or, you know or are all these people that are following all of the things you're doing are they people that you want following right. all of the things you're doing and right. I, I think something like that is is very critical you Definitely. know and i feel like i don't see enough and i don't even know that, that there can be enough yeah things like that for yeah. for younger just younger people in general right you know boys to learn how to treat girls and mm -hmm. girls to learn how to interact and treat boys and right just uh an overall i think uh lack of just common courtesy like we were forced to yeah. learn as kids yeah. you know it, well and 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 think about the you know the dynamics too these these kids are on the go the parents are on the go the kids sure. are on the go so you're going from from school you know again this could be all sure. COVID, but school to sports to music to this to that and and the lives are just like this and so the there's this little social interaction mm -hmm. that happens here and then the you know periodic yeah. get together and yeah, it was, it's it's definitely light years different than even even I feel like how my kids were raised, sure, yeah. right? So um, the more those types of things, and I think we're we're, I mean I don't know everybody's situation, but I know there's there's teen coaches. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, a gal that I had met a while ago in San Diego, she works with teens. I had done some um, speaking with. Um, some the girls that were graduating out of the foster care system mm -hmm. there's a, a group down in san diego and and just talking to them mm -hmm. about that again positive loving yourself and and taking the self-care and, and things like that um they so appreciated it and the it's never too early to start that yeah you know so i'm wholeheartedly um love those you know kinds of groups and organizations that that are there to mentor um the girls and, and make it fun yeah. right and make it a safe space to express whatever yeah I'd, I'd love for you to do some things like that and i could post it on the for the you know for the girls yeah to see that because a lot of times they feel even even as women they feel segregated because well this is for moms or this oh, is for right you know all these women are older they're all my mom's age they don't understand you know you get to yeah. that point where and even i i jokingly tell the parents i bring in all these young guys because now i'm the old guy yeah you know and then <laughs> you're not you're not cool you're not funny your jokes are i don't know what you're talking about anymore so you know you have to keep things kind of young for them and it's relatable Absolutely. and they feel different you know and again like i was telling you at some point a lot of these kids are going to ask questions or or have things that they need to get off of their chest that they're only going to feel comfortable they have a relationship with you but you aren't going to judge you're not going to punish you're not going to take things away from them so they feel open to you mm -hmm. but again you age out and well now you're just like my dad you're going to tell right. me the same thing my dad's <laughs> going to tell me or you're just like my grandpa so you know you always have to have that relatability but yes i think something like that would be awesome too to because i always try to find things and quotes yeah. to post on there just for 
you right. know, people to watch rather than just a generic, you know. Right. Well, one of the gals in my mastermind, she 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 has a teen mm -hmm. and last year early right before covid she and i did a it was supposed to be a mother daughter and actually a bunch of the moms didn't show up and so it was mostly they just sent their daughters wow. but we, it was like kind of a little fun self care night and sure. i talked about um the the product side which was this this makeup mat and the, the affirmations on it and how we can you know do this ritual and and how it important it is to take time for ourselves to love and appreciate every day mm -hmm. who we are. So I, I know this gal wants to do some stuff with the teens because mm -hmm. she has one teen, so I'll, we'll, sure. we'll stay connected on that yeah. and how we can get you some other positive programming. Yeah, because I know there's some out there. It's just sometimes yeah. unless you stumble on it, you right. don't know. And then again, there's so many things out there. I'd, I'd really like to steer any of the kids that follow towards those kind of things too. Right. You know, But it's, uh, it's just something I think from the school side I've seen – lately that's sorely sorely needed and i'm curious now as we start to go back how that dynamic has changed you know yeah. how appreciative the kids are going to be to go back in school right or how, <laughs> how long they're going to remain appreciative and then just go back to the old you know the kids that were getting in trouble and things so it's definitely different for them um and i'm hoping maybe they had some time to self yeah, hopefully, <laughs> or, and not be stuck on playing video games all day long, too, right? Whatever, you right? Know. So that's oh, that's gosh. one of the things I'm hoping will yeah. change in the next, oh, I think, month. We actually go back right after, well, Monday. Okay. I, okay. We start. I start back full every day. Um, they were giving us time off, not time off, but we'd get to work from home. Okay. Every other day, and then I think April first is when we have our first group come all in. All right. So it'll be a fresh start for. A new beginning. We'll see how that yeah. goes. Yeah, fantastic. Kind of interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I feel like I'm so removed from from all of that because my, you know, my kids, kids are, are older, w well out of <laughs> school age. So unless yeah. Ashley did a master's, but you know, she's she's uh, would even probably do that online even if she were. Sure. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's easier now to do because you can do it from home. Right. Right. But I mean, it's it's evolution, and I think yeah. that's it's opened up more doors for people because i know i've had conversations with some of the players that i've had that have been drafted you know i mm. kind of, you know the cycle when you're done with the game you come back and you sit in your room in yeah. your hotel room and you're watching tv or you're playing video or you're texting texting yeah. so if you can knock out a class you know your first year your second year then there's just so much more to to accomplish rather than right. waste that time. Right. You know, because you know eventually this is going to come to an end. Right. And, oh, that's interesting. So, yeah. So, a lot of them will just put their education on hold or yeah. won't even, yeah. Yeah. Oftentimes, when they get drafted out of high school, there's some type of money for education oh, okay. to, to kind of leverage against, you know, the option of going to school. Well, you right. still can, but trying to explain to them, let's say you play five years and you out of baseball at 25, it's different sitting in a college classroom with a bunch of 19 year olds and you're 25. Yes, <laughs> you totally. might You might think you're still young and cool, but right. at 25, <laughs> you're, you're an old guy and it's not as comfortable. So, uh, uh, you know, if you can knock some of that out while you're doing nothing, it makes it that much easier. Right, but, make that time productive yeah, for exactly. sure. Which, Solid again, advice, Ernie. <laughs> well, yeah, which I don't know how many of them did it, but they, you know what, uh, all of the ones that we've had, they've thankfully gone through and they've used that money for education that's great so it, it's not money wasted and i think a lot of times the the organizations in essence it's fictional money because okay. if you don't use it they don't they yeah. don't lose it we yeah. just have it sitting there for you and uh -huh. if you choose not to go to school and you go 30 years and never use it then we never had to write that check wow <laughs> so they're giving it to you so you might as well use it for right. something right yeah. yeah but it's um like i said it's it's interesting the way things have evolved so mm -hmm. um i guess lastly yes um how do they find you yes. how can we sign up for absolutely your classes and your app um, yes so my we'll start with the website okay. is i'm actually launching a brand new website but it'll still be this the same uh url okay it's um Christine Howard is a very popular name. So I, I in my rebrand, it's Christine Marie Howard dot com. Okay. And Instagram and Facebook are also Christine Marie Howard, except Instagram has um, uh, an underscore after it. But you okay. should still be able to find me if you just do Christine Marie Howard. Okay. And I, I am offering a... Um, uh, if you go to Instagram or Facebook mm -hmm. or when my new app or when my new... Um, 
website is launched, you can get a free uh, get a free chapter from my book. So I'm okay. doing like a free like a promo right now for my book, and the website will have what programs I'm offering, classes, my app information about how to download. The app is on there. It's called the Radiant Achiever. I have articles, journal lessons you can do if you want to do some reflection. Some a lot of videos, audio. Um, what else do I have? Um, a, an e-course is on there. I have some tips and galleries. So there's a whole bunch of stuff you can search by topic and see. Mm -hmm. You know, what are you looking for? You know, what kind of motivation or support do you need? You can just bring down the menu and search by topic. So Radiant Achiever, and you'll see that on my website. Um, and also, it's on. It's for both platforms. So okay. um, there'll be a, a little QR code you can scan or, or click the link to, to download. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think that's it. And um, I'm also on YouTube. So I don't know for sure. I know Christine Marie Howard is the name I have in one place, but Your Coach Chris, I think, is is if you search Your Co Coach Chris, it'll come up that way mm -hmm. too. Yeah, if you find one, they should lead you to, okay, good. to the other one. Because I, I just renamed that, but I wasn't able to change it at like the root level. So my channel does show christine marie howard so it should hopefully get you there but i'll be adding a, you know a lot more content i'm planning to uh to get out on there too yeah it's tough isn't it to keep <laughs> well i know and that, i mean honestly and that is the thing like yeah. do i really need to be in all these places because again that can start to you can start to spin yourself out and feel and get in that place of stress that because you're buying into what somebody else's formula is sure. so uh, i'm going to be reevaluating that and see where you know my i'm committed to my app i'm committed to my youtube channel and um I think I will definitely always have some sort of presence on Instagram, just, you know, might not be as often as as um, I am posting now or how some people post. Yeah. I think they just kind of gravitate, you know, as something new comes, everyone kind of shifts to the next. Totally, and, totally. You know, but I think there's still, there's always going to be people that are comfortable with one and they're going to stay there. And, yeah. And, the other and then that's as far as yeah it goes. so yeah i think it's it's important to to be accessible but you can always use those later to just direct people definitely exactly another, you know but i know that's been talking to other people that do podcasts and things like that the content thing is hard yeah it's really tough and then like i was telling you that's part of the reason that i chose to to chop up the videos rather right. than just put them out because you know i can have I can have 30 interviews and make 90 out of them. Uh, that's smart. No, I <laughs> totally agree. Or I can agree. just have 30, you know, because it's tough. Even there's sometimes at night before I go to bed, I say, okay, I'm going to put one here, put one here. And then I end up falling asleep and I yeah. you know, make sure you haven't. But, you know, it's, it's again, it does, I don't want it to be pressure. It's more just no, fun. and right. You know, it, there, it's always there, which is kind yeah. of the cool thing too. You know, I I look at things now for more for my daughter, you know, when, when your parents or your grandparents, you know, when you think, boy, I wish they would have written me. Oh, a book, right. or I wish they would have had a novel or, right. you know, I wish I would have really known who my grandfather was. Or, you know, you look back and the, yeah. the, the people in our lives who, it, it, if we didn't have any interaction with them, we don't have anything tangible no. for them, you yeah. know. And now that you think, well, this is something my kids can come right. back and go, you know, who was your, your grandmother or who was your, right. you know. So I think of it more in that in that way, not necessarily to perpetuate me so yeah. to speak just, oh you're leaving a legacy you know that <laughs> <laughs> yeah well we'll see all, all my often ask my 87 viewers <laughs> uh, um but I, no i mean i'm looking forward to um to everything that you're doing i mean i, I like getting ideas from you the app has me really curious yeah. um you know i really would like to get uh get some of our students connected to you Perfect. um and just you know because there's information out there and like you'd mentioned the kids are a little bit more savvy now yeah. at a younger age so i think they'll, they'll get some of this thing and i think that you know social media for a lot of kids can be both positive and negative mm -hmm. and so the more positive things i can find for them to to look and follow and even if they only pick up one or two things you know i have a couple of former players that are doing great things with investments and real estate Fantastic. and things like that and so you know I, I want them to see hey here's a guy that thought baseball was going to be his career path and now he's worth you know millions because right. he went another way you know he took his off time and was very productive with it and, mm -hmm. you know did things so um and he's a very smart guy and he just kind of came from the same background he just he kind of saw a, a head that baseball was not going to be his life work you know mm -hmm. there was another way to go about it so he's a he's a great uh 
a great motivator for me and for the kids that I send him to watch or send yeah. to watch his videos. So that's awesome. Yeah, anything I can find to help them out, I think, is going to be productive. I, you know, just this thought just popped in. I, I, um, I think I saw her speak on a podcast or something. She, I believe, was like a former Olympic softball player, mm -hmm. and I can't remember her name or what. I, I might have it saved somewhere, and she you know that career ended mm -hmm. and she thought that was her life work sure and now she's go going on and she's actually working with girls in softball and the joy she is getting as a coach it far surpasses her experience as an olympic mm -hmm. athlete she said yeah. oh my you know this is my life work and i think our life w life's work evolves if we allow it to sure. to go back to you know not to rehash stuff yeah. but but we you know i love that you share that perspective with your students this is this is a piece of time utilize it be be happy for it and fully present and then know that there's more for you to do, yeah. you know? And there might be multiple things for you to do, you know? People switch careers all the time. Why Why not the same thing happening, you know, from for athletes? Yeah, yeah, and it's just, it's that enlightenment where you understand that you're, yeah. not to get too deep, but you know, you're here for a different purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, so much time we, we have to take care of ourselves, but we also think that we're the end all be all. Yeah. And sometimes realizing that you can get a lot more gratitude if you just kind of open yourself and, and see these other people doing far better things than you could reach. Yeah. And you were a small part of that. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about that a lot with coaching and we, we try to mm -hmm. explain to, to kids now when they come in, I go, do you really ever understand how hard it is for me to know that every kid that walks in the door is a third younger than me but at your age <laughs> you know 10 times more yeah. than i ever did or your uh, talent because of the time that you were you know you were born you're coming in you're getting this knowledge 15 years before i ever did yeah is so, that amazing you know that it's a it's kind of a pride swallowing <laughs> process but you know you know you have to take joy in that and understanding look you you have a responsibility to go out and take this somewhere yeah. you know we're giving this information to you as adults because we want you to go farther than we did right right you know? well didn't we used to go to people's houses and we were taught you know leave it better than you sure. than how you showed up or you stay at somebody's bar or somebody's Thing, yeah. whatever you clean it up it looks better right I, right that i think that's part of our responsibility is mm -hmm. to leave this earth a little bit better than how we found it yeah. right so we can do that by honoring our gifts our talents our desires our callings and and um acting on that yeah yeah so. We're, we only have one life yeah exactly <laughs> exactly all right. Well, I want to thank you for coming down. I think we probably went over the yeah, hour. Yeah, probably I, did. I, I told you. So that's <laughs> one of the things. But it, it's good, though. It's perfect. It, it is. You'll have to understand when you start doing more of them. It just yeah. sometimes a conversation just flows. Right. And, you know, when you get people on that you have um, maybe a past connection with and you just start talking about things and you start right. talking about things that they're interested in and i mean i found out three or four things that i had never knew yeah but most of our conversations are just short and, and in passing you know when you would you'd bring chris in right you know and right. so you realize boy you really never knew a lot about yeah, certain people yeah, yeah. And you had a lot in common for for a period of time but you never really have that chance and i'm always going to favor a conversation like this, mm -hmm. you know, even over a phone call or yeah. over something. So I think these are things that now I learned to value more because they're kind of going away. It's in priceless. A bit. That in person yeah. is priceless yeah. for sure. Because of the time factor, the distance factor. Yeah. You you can access more people now. Right. You know, you can talk to people overseas and things mm -hmm. like that. But I, I think just at its heart, that face to face conversation is always going to be something that, that people need. Yeah. And there's a lot more depth to having yeah. that conversation that yeah. way so and especially when you're it. locked in a room and you can't get out you yeah know? <laughs> I, I, yeah I, I could have asked so many more questions and made it uncomfortable but i didn't i didn't for you but um it's all good. It, i'm an open book it's it, all good <laughs> yeah well yeah you have a book now so you yeah. put everything out there but it, it's it's awesome to see and yeah. like i said i'm i'm looking forward Thank to you. it because it it's really inspiring to see somebody that's not afraid to step out and, and reinvent themselves in, yeah. in different ways. I mean, a book, an app, yeah. you know, mentoring, online podcasts. So right. you're, you're changing everything all the time about yourself, which mm -hmm. is good because you're going to find out what ultimately makes you happy. Yeah. And, you know, you're going to be able to pass that on to other people. And that, I think that's the most important part is that you're taking that journey and you're using it to, yeah. to kind of extend yourself out to well, other people. Well, thank you. And, and I want to say, I want to maybe correct you on one thing. Uh, like... I feel like I'm being more of my authentic self now than I ever was. And so it's it's 
expressing myself, mm -hmm. who I authentically am in all these different ways. And and I think a lot of people can get, again, fearful because they think they're becoming a different person. Mm -hmm. I never felt more me than, than I do now. So okay. just a little redirect okay. on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Totally understand. But I yeah. get that. No, but that, it's great. It's yeah. great. So again, um, I want to thank you for coming down and making the drive. I hope you uh, enjoy kind of coming back to the old stomping grounds. Even Absolutely. If it was only, I wish if I, I would have known and we would have done this in Wisconsin. It would have yeah. been. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. This is perfect. I yeah. thank you for the invite. I'm happy to be here and reconnect. No, I'm glad you did it. And actually, I'm looking forward now to your uh, your posts from the mission. Yeah, You have okay. a, lot of, a lot of beautiful area there and it's you got today and tomorrow are going to be gorgeous, I think. Yes. Probably in the maybe light 60s, not real, good. Not real hot. No, good. I was yeah. curious. I totally didn't even think to look at the weather. Yeah. And my daughter texted me on my way up. She's in Philly. Ash Ashley lives in Philly. 80 degrees in Philly today. Oh, I'm like, wow. how is that even possible? Yeah. 80 degrees in March on the East Coast? Like, yeah. really? I'm, maybe tomorrow will snow. Who knows? But I'm <laughs> like, and, and I was looking at the temperature in my car and it said 63. And I said, yes, because like... This is like I have a this in a sweater. Like yeah. it only gets warmer from here. So yeah. I'm glad I wasn't. Uh, yeah, facing yeah. 80 degree weather. No, I, I don't think it'll be. I think it'll be mild unless you get into the 2 a.m. 3 a.m. But most of the time it's going to be in the 60s here. Okay, it, yeah. beautiful. It'll be nice today Perfect. and tomorrow. So so fun. But yeah. So again, <laughs> thank you. And like I said, I'm sorry if we went over the hour, but oh, it's good. I told you these always go if you start conversating well. Yeah. So for now, I want to say uh, thank you to my guest. You can find her at Christine Marie Howard. Howard, uh, Instagram, look for the app. You can also look for the book coming out shortly. Um, and you can find her on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. So if you get a chance, uh, take a look at some of the uh, content that she's put out. It's great information and great motivation. So uh, something for everyone. But again, I want to thank her for coming out. And again, I want to thank uh, Adam Schwartz for providing our building here and 100% media for uh, doing all the editing and the videography for us. So until next time, We'll see you later.